contribution of Catholicism to global sustainable development. My name is Professor Michael Manulak. I'm uh, a professor at the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs, focusing on global environmental politics and international organizations. I'm delighted that you can join us today for this exciting event uh, with uh, Cardinal Cherney and, and two uh, very compelling panels. Um, I'll have a few uh, remarks to set the, the context for, for some of the conversation that we're going to be having. Uh, but first, I wanted to um, open the floor to our two co-hosts, the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs at Carleton University uh, and uh, the University of St. Michael's College at the University of Toronto. Um, so I'll turn the floor briefly to, uh, to Teddy Sammy, uh, the director of NIPSIA for a welcome on behalf of the school. <coughs> Thank you, Michael. Uh, welcome, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here. I want to thank Michael for the opportunity to say a few words. As he's mentioned, I'm the director of the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs at Carlton University in Ottawa. Uh, we're delighted to partner with uh, the University of St. Michael's College at the University of Toronto uh, for today's conference on the contribution of Catholicism to global sustainable development. Uh, this is, of course, a very important uh, global sustainable development is, of course, a very important topic. I think this could not be timelier, given the ongoing war in Ukraine and the various challenges that we've seen in the last couple of years as a result of COVID. I was actually looking at my calendar again this morning and realized that we're almost seven years into Agenda 2030 and we've another eight years or so to go. I think there are many, many challenges, uh, in particular poverty, inequality. Uh, political instability conflicts. Uh, we've seen in the last couple of years, I think, how gains that took many years to achieve could quickly erode, in particular when we look at what's going on in the developing world. Um, most estimates from the World Bank and the IMF have indicated that millions of people have gone back into poverty uh, in the last couple of years, and the longer but the pandemic continues, the more the challenges are going to be. So I think there's still a lot of work to be done for us to even get close to what Agenda 2030 was trying to do. And there's a real concern, of course, about what uh, the world as a whole can do in order to address these many challenges. So I want to thank Michael and, and his colleagues for organizing today's event. I think this is a very important subject, uh, one that we will need to continue to discuss. And I'm certainly hopeful that uh, today's event will contribute directly or indirectly uh, to conversations around how we can get closer to achieving Agenda 2030. Uh, so without any uh, uh, more delays, I will turn it over to Michael uh, for the rest of the meeting. So thank you again and have a great conference. Thanks a lot, Teddy. Uh, I'll turn also the floor to uh, Professor Mark McGowan, the Interim Principal and Vice President at St. Michael's, the University of St. Michael's College. Thank you, Michael. Uh, the virtual scene behind me is St. Michael's College, and I'd like to acknowledge that the land upon which the University of St. Michael's College operates for thousands of years has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat people, the Seneca, and more recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit. And today, we at St. Michael's uh, see this as a meeting place as well to the home of many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island. And we at St. Michael's are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. Um, as has been said, my name is Mark McGowan. I'm a professor of history at the University of Toronto in Celtic Studies, uh, but a specialist in religious history. And so when Michael and several others made uh, this opportunity uh, for St. Michael's to engage in, in this conference today, I was absolutely delighted. And I do send the regrets of President David Sylvester, who is in St. John's, Newfoundland, and wanted to be here, but he's with a, uh, a meeting of university presidents doing whatever university presidents do. Thank goodness, as a vice president, I'm spared that. Um, but I think he's particularly delighted that really this conference today engages St. Michael's in his vision, St. Mike's 180, with regard to uh, St. Mike's being a voice in global social justice, in environmental justice, uh, in welcoming uh, new Canadians and refugees uh, to Toronto and to our campus, particularly within the context of the current crisis uh, in Ukraine. Um, and really honors the tradition of the University of St. Michael's College as being uh, one of those places where new Canadians and Canadian working class families could aspire to at least sending one or two of their children uh, to pursue 
uh, post-secondary learning. And so to be engaged in this conference today is, is particularly special for us. Um, I'd like to thank the panelists, uh, certainly uh, His Eminence Cardinal Cherney. And I, I said in our preamble that it's this is a virtual welcome back to Canada uh, for His Eminence. I'd like to welcome uh, for the first time to, uh, virtually to St. Michael's, uh, His Excellency, uh, the Apostolic Nuncio, uh, and all of our distinguished panelists. Um, I would be particularly remiss if I didn't feel joyful that one of the panelists today is Peter Baltutis, who is my former doctoral student. So I'm absolutely over the moon uh, that Peter is here today uh, to, to share his great intellect and his insights uh, with all of us. Uh, and finally, I'd like to thank Michael for really being the, uh, uh, how should we say, the navigator of this ship as we move forward. And uh, uh, to the people who made it possible at St. Michael's. Natalie, who is my executive assistant, is on the call and uh, her youth and expertise makes her a far better person to manage Zoom uh, than the vice president, for sure. Um, Sheila Eaton, who did all of the graphic work uh, as part of our comms department, and definitely our head of comms who promoted this uh, relentlessly, uh, Lori Morris. So thank you to the St. Michael's team. Um, I, uh, I wish everyone uh, a, uh, a, an insightful, interesting, and informative day. Uh, and. Uh, and uh, I will cease my remarks there. Thanks, Mark, and thanks, Teddy, uh, for the uh, warm welcome. Um, I'll provide just a few minutes of, of context before we, we begin our conversation with the Cardinal. Um, so on the subject of this, this conference on the focus on global sustainable development, um, simply put, we are currently facing a crisis in global sustainable development. The canonical definition of sustainable development comes from the 1987 report of the Brundtland Commission, a development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generation to meet their own needs. A sustainable development approach brings together the economic, the social, and the environmental into one integral whole uh, in order to uh, promote a, a sustainable um, and healthy planet. Governments agreed in 2015, and, and uh, Teddy referenced this, uh, on the need uh, to promote sustainable development and, and agreed on a set of 17 sustainable development goals that uh, range from eliminating poverty, promoting gender equality, uh, tackling the loss of biodiversity uh, and desertification on a global scale. Um, and while uh, states agreed on these goals, progress in implementing them even before the pandemic was slow. Uh, since the pandemic, it's very much rolled into reverse, and the world is very much uh, backtracking on many of the targets that they set for themselves when they agreed upon the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, the most recent report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, its sixth assessment report, the most recent chapter on mitigation released just earlier this month, uh, paints a stark picture of where we stand in relation to the, uh, the challenge, uh, the central challenge of global climate change. It is very clear, the science is, is uh, abundantly clear, that if we are not able to stabilize global emissions by the middle of this century, by 2025, uh, just three short years away, um, uh, it, uh, the, temp the goal of uh, the global goal, uh, to, in order to have a good chance of uh, meeting the global goal of limiting global warming to within 1.5 degrees uh, Celsius uh, above pre-industrial levels uh, is soon going to be out of reach. We are on track as of COP26 this past November uh, toward a uh, 2.7 degrees warming. Um, very simply put, um, the uh, uh, addressing climate change in a significant and strong and sustained way is a fundamental prerequisite to achieving sustainable development and integral human development on a global level. Um, the Climate change's impacts will affect the most vulnerable in the world, the most vulnerable in, this, in our societies disproportionately. And this is where uh, it, it is in this context, I think that the Pope's call to hear the cry of the poor, to hear the cry of the earth are of particular relevance. It is in this context that Laudato Si is more relevant now even than it was in 2015 when it was released. Today, we're gonna to unpack all of these themes. Uh, through uh, Cardinal Cherney, His Eminence Cardinal Cherney's uh, uh, keynote address, as well as two very compelling panels, uh, one focusing on the role of the church as a international actor, as a diplomatic actor, the Holy See in particular in world affairs, and then the role and the contribution of the laity, 
uh, Catholic organizations, we're going to um, Catholic universities, Catholic um, churches in local communities all have a role to play in tackling this crisis of sustainable development that we currently face. Um, and so just very briefly in terms of our schedule for today, I'm going to introduce uh, the Cardinal in a moment and we'll have his keynote address. Hopefully we'll have about 15 minutes for question and answer uh, with, with Cardinal Cherney. Uh, then we'll take a short break from 10.30 until 10.45. Um, and then we'll uh, convene our, uh, our panel, our first morning panel uh, with Severin de Nulen, uh, Massimo Fagioli and uh, Anne Leahy um, to, uh, uh, to tackle the question of the role of the church as an, international, as an actor in international affairs. We'll then take a brief 30 minute lunch break before coming to panel two on the role of the lady, local churches and La Dato Si, uh, featuring Peter Baltudis, uh, Jenny Cafiso, Joe Gunn and John Malloy. Uh, from there, we'll have some wrap-up remarks by His Excellency Archbishop Ivan Jerkovich, the Apostolic Nuncio uh, to Canada, um, and they'll be uh, and and we'll wrap up the conference around two o'clock. Um, there'll be a number of opportunities for question and answer. Please put your questions in the question uh, in the chat box. Uh, and the moderators, myself in in the case of Cardinal Cherney's talk in the first panel, uh, Father John Meehan in the case of panel two, uh, we'll do our best to get to as many of those questions as we possibly can. And don't feel that you have to wait until the question and answer period. They can uh, we can uh, collect questions as they as they come and then pose them in the question and answer period. Um, I, uh, I believe the event schedule has gone out uh, to all those registered. Perhaps we'll, we'll uh, post that in the chat as well, just so that it's at your fingertips as we go through the event, but it should be in your inbox as you got a reminder email this morning uh, about your registration for the event. Um, and then uh, we'll, we'll try to, uh, I would encourage you also if possible to stay uh, for the entire conference. It is a really compelling set of speakers, a really exceptional set of speakers that are able to shed light on these important questions. So I hope that you'll be able to, uh, to be with us. Um, and then finally, this event will be recorded uh, by, uh, by the University of St. Michael's College and, and at some point in the future, it'll be made uh, available online. Um, so thanks again very much uh, to all of our, uh, all of our panelists, uh, uh, to His Eminence, uh, Cardinal Cherney, uh, His Excellency uh, 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 Ivan Jerkovich for, uh, for joining us today. And now falls on me the great honor of introducing our keynote speaker for, uh, for the, today, um, Cardinal Michael Cherney. Now the prefect, rather uh, all of our previous material said ad interim prefect, but as of this past Saturday, uh, he has become the prefect uh, for the dicastery for promoting integral human development. Um, and he is someone uh, throughout his life. Um, and, and I was reading through his bio uh, in order to, to select a few uh, pieces, but he's really made a life out of hearing the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor um, in, in the most profound ways. Um, he contributed to the writing of La Dato Si, which I'm sure uh, will, uh, will come up uh, extensively in our conversations today. In fact, both of our panels are focused on, on it um, and has had long issues, uh, long involvement on issues of migration, refugees, human rights, environment on multiple continents in North America and Latin America and Africa and Central America. Um, there is, um, to put it bluntly, nobody who is better placed to speak to the issues that we're going to be talking about today. So it is an absolute honor to welcome his eminence uh, to us, uh, with us today. Um, Cardinal Cherney was born in Czechos uh, what was then Czechoslovakia and came to Canada at the tender age of two. Um, he was ordained to the priesthood in 1973. Next year, uh, I believe, will be 50 years, uh, a big, uh, big milestone for the Cardinal. Um, he completed a doctorate at the University of Chicago in 1978. Um, shortly after that, he founded the Center uh, for uh, Jesuits. Uh, now I think it's the Forum of Jesuits for Faith and Social Justice in 1989 and served as its, as its first director. Um, in 1989, following the assassination of six Jesuits, uh, and others in San Salvador. Uh, Cardinal Cherney put his name forward to, uh, to replace them. And then from 91, 1990 to 1991, served as the director of the Institute for Human Rights at the Central American University in San Salvador. Um, from uh, 2002 to 2010, he founded and directed the African Jesuit AIDS uh, Network uh, based, I think, in Nairobi. Um, and so um, uh, heavy uh, involvement in, in, in that global pandemic and crisis and managing that fundamental to uh, issues of sustainable development. Um, I could go on and on uh, about his extensive background. Uh, he was appointed a cardinal in 2019 uh, and prefect at interim uh, of the dicastery for promoting integral human development um, early this year in January. 
Um, and then uh, this just uh, 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 this past month was made uh, the permanent um, prefect. Um, last month he was sent, and perhaps it'll come up, uh, to Ukraine uh, with humanitarian aid to, uh, on behalf of the Pope uh, following Russia's aggression uh, in, in Ukraine. Uh, so I am uh, very excited uh, to welcome Cardinal Michael Cherney and, and wish to do so very warmly. Welcome Cardinal Cherney. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the lovely welcome. And uh, hello to everyone. I won't go through all the titles, the excellencies and the honorables, but you're all excellent and honorable. And uh, I was asked to speak for half an hour and I promise not to speak any less than half an hour. So prepare yourselves for, uh, for that long a ride at least. The aspect of Catholicism of interest in this case will be Catholic social teaching, which stretches back to the Hebrew Bible but has its modern foundation in Pope Leo XIII's 1891 encyclical Rerum Novarum, literally about new times. My focus will be more recent though, the two social encyclicals of Pope Francis, Laudato Si, 2015, about care for our common home, and Fratelli Tutti, 2020, about our all being siblings. Indeed, being siblings in our common home could hardly be more dramatically relevant than now. Of course, I am referring to Russia's invasion of Ukraine and another dozen or more bloody wars dragging on at the same time in different parts of the world. But I'm also thinking of the new stage of the indigenous people's relationship with the church and with the general population in Canada. With the Pope's apologies in Rome and later this year in Canada, I believe there is a movement away from colonial and contemporary injustice and towards all being siblings in social friendship. And these latter words are found in the title and subtitle of Fratelli Tutti. Before my current stint in Rome, uh, as you heard, when I lived in Africa from 2002 to 2010 and worked on HIV AIDS, I learned a terrible snippet of dialogue that introduces today's topic. To the very conventional question, comment ça va, came back the loaded response, déjà mieux que l'année qui vient, surely better than next year. To dismiss this reply as a chatty bit of gallows humor would be a big mistake. As soon as you start to unpack it, you find yourself entangled in the heaviest reflections on slavery and colonialism and the injustices and hopelessness that they continue to engender. History, both centuries old and contemporary, continues to generate the gloomy déjà mieux que l'année qui vient. I don't think you can emerge until you begin to take slavery and colonialism seriously, not as ancient history, but as contemporary analysis. So, according to my title, Vatican diplomacy with the, with the Catholicism it represents is best understood as coherently and consistently seeking to respond to all that's tightly packed into déjà mieux que l'année qui vient. And in order to appreciate it as a distinctive, appropriate response to that enormous challenge, let me ask you a rhetorical question. Does the diplomacy of your own country coherently and consistently seek to overturn déjà mieux que l'année qui vient? Of course, I'm going to leave you to answer that question. Instead, let me claim that with the loss of the Papal States, Vatican diplomacy became non-national. As you're listening, instead of comparing it with the diplomacy of other nations, it may be more useful to compare it with how individuals and society try to overturn déjà mieux que l'année qui vient. So please grant me this first premise, that Vatican diplomacy is rather different from that of nation states and is more like what people do to generate good solutions to déjà mieux que l'année qui vient. And here comes the second claim. Since déjà mieux que l'année qui vient is not resignation, since it's an, an indignant and profound and multifaceted, but finally coherent and repeated challenge. 
So the right answer is in the title, which was assigned to me for this day's talk, Global Sustainable Development, or as I prefer to call it, and I will quote the name of the department that I'm now responsible for, Integral Human Development. But for the moment, we won't parse the vocabulary. Now that we have the question and the right answer, it only remains for me to persuade you that Catholicism and its diplomacy are always and everywhere on target because the heart of the matter, the core message is the human, the person in society, the people in development. By integral, we mean the whole person's development and the full development of every person. And by development, we mean fulfillment of potential. Now you're disappointed because we already know that, didn't we? So give me another minute, please. The Catholic contribution isn't just to state the great goal right. It is also, and not always popularly, to keep on identifying the obstacles which, often unconsciously, sometimes maliciously, get in the way of integral human development. In other words, while other diplomacies are avoiding the real problem and pushing partial or fake solutions, Catholic discourse and diplomacy keep on repeating its truly profound mantras of the common goal and whatever stands in its way. Now, how am I going to convince you of this? I'll begin by attacking the French Revolution, which is something Catholics have been doing since even before it took place. So, allons enfants. The foundations of the Western world and its current socio political and economic configuration rest on those enlightenment ideals that were famously summarized in the iconic motto, liberty, equality, fraternity. By setting universal solidarity as its focus, Fratelli Tutti could not avoid engaging in a comparison, however veiled, with the formulation of these principles as solemnly expressed in the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen elaborated during the French Revolution. This juridical text defines freedom as being able to do whatever one wants as long as it does not harm others. La liberté consiste à pouvoir faire tout ce qui ne nuit pas à autrui. This serves to underline resolutely the right of the individual to self-determination. It emancipates the individual from predetermined obligations and duties that come from being born in a given social class. Equality, on the other hand, refers principally to the legal system of the state, since it derives from the fact that the law, insofar as it is an expression of the general will of the citizens, is the same for all, regardless of rank or social status. Finally, fraternity, our all being siblings, is expressed as that sense of solidarity that is established among citizens when they recognize that they are free and equal. In this sense, full sovereignty is granted to a people or nation whose citizens see themselves as free and equal members of a given society. The Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen is one of the highest expressions of the recognition of human dignity. It is an indispensable point of reference for the establishment of democracies and for the drafting of numerous constitutional charters, especially since the Second World War. It is not surprising then that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights promulgated by the General Assembly of the United Nations in 1948 took the Declaration of 1789 as its model and even quoted some parts verbatim. The UN Declaration, like that of 1789, reflects the needs of its time. Compared with that of 1789, the greatest innovations are the abolition of slavery and the recognition of the rights of women, such as to autonomy or to motherhood, and of the rights to work, family, and citizenship. 
Fratelli Tutti raises the following questions. What do words such as liberty, equality, and fraternity mean for us today? To be more explicit, what consequences does the emergence of a global marketplace have for the international protection of human rights, both of individuals and of peoples? If we consider the atrocities committed against human dignity that we still witness today, genocide, torture, the death penalty, fundamentalism, racism, discrimination against women and girls, not to mention a dozen catastrophic wars all going on at the same time, can we really maintain the univers universality of human rights as extending equally to all people? Pope Francis points out that respect for individual liberties and a certain administratively guaranteed equality, while indispensable conditions for affirming the rights of the person and of peoples are not sufficient to guarantee that they will be effectively enjoyed by all. And this is at the heart of my argument. From the Pope's point of view, we must start from consciously cultivated fraternity in order to shed light on what freedom and equality are and how they are to be understood. Our all being siblings is more than a generic sense of solidarity based on the common recognition of a national identity, since it precedes and goes beyond the rights and duties upon which civil coexistence is established. Being siblings is based on the recognition of the fundamental equality of men and women, young and middle and old, without exception. Thus, being siblings is founded on natural law, even, more, even before being enshrined in the positive law of a given society. In this light, equality cannot be affirmed only in principle, as an abstract concept. Rather, equality must be the result of a conscious and careful cultivation of fraternity. This means being educated and formed to recognize the other as my fellow being, my fellow human being, and as my equal, educated and formed to recognize. This must be expressed through a clear political will and concerted efforts on the part of all those who are responsible for education and formation. By contrast, any idea of equality based exclusively on laws adopted, positive law adopted by society, on the human person defined legally as a citizen, homo societatis, creates closed worlds, closed worlds, and treats human relations as a contract between business associates. Unless we all recognize ourselves as siblings, the exercise of freedom is restricted and reduced to autonomy, a weaker expression of human liberty. Living the difference between being siblings or solidarity and any other form of association circumvents a twofold illusion. The illusion that thinking only of oneself is more advantageous than thinking of others, and the illusion that the common good is based on personal interests, the sum of private goods. Seeing our all being siblings and equal through the lens of individual liberties threatens the universality of human rights. The same is true of the absolute and unquestionable freedom of the market. The rights of commercial enterprises cannot be put before the dignity of the poor or the care of the environment. The conclusion reached by Pope Francis is clear. Individualism does not make us more free, more equal, or more fraternal. That's uh, Fratelli Tutti 105, if you want to look it up or tweet it again. When it comes to the meaning of terms such as freedom, equality, and fraternity, 
The heart of the matter lies in this basic acknowledgement, this basic acknowledgement, attributing value and dignity to the human person, regardless of any historical, geographical, cultural, political, and it's not in my text, but I will add economic factors. This is followed by another affirmation, which is almost a prophecy. If we do not recognize that every human being has a fundamental and inalienable right to his or her integral development, then there will be no future, either for fraternity or for the survival of humanity. Any limitations of this right, what I call a fundamental right to integral development, any limitation of this right or attempts to bind its exercise to certain conditions, for example, a personal determination to assert oneself or stand up for oneself, such conditions are in reality violations of human rights. The right to human development cannot be subjected to any calculation of profit, nor to any claim of social utility, which ends up justifying the option to leave the weaker or less gifted behind. Rather, our understanding, our hermeneutics of the great right, of this great right to development, must always maintain the individual within the fabric of a social we, a new. Otherwise, our vision of human rights dissolves into various irresolvable contradictions. A pernicious reductionism arises, for example, from an excessive emphasis on individual freedom, which often ends up triggering a downward spiral of conflict and violence. This broad premise of community as a necessary condition of the individual and here I will share something that I learned in Africa, even though it's expressed in Latin, sumus ergo sum. And I'm still tilting at the French Revolution, you can see, sumus ergo sum, enables us to extend the meaning of being siblings and to emphasize the need to properly interpret the rights of the human person. On the basis of this approach, the Pope revisits two topics, two key topics of the social teaching of the church in an original way, the principle of solidarity and the social role of property. Regarding the principle of solidarity, Pope Francis calls upon the major agencies of education and formation, families, schools, parishes, cultural centers, recreational centers, etc to devote themselves to the conscious and careful cultivation of fraternity. Transmitting the values of freedom, mutual respect, sharing and inclusion is perhaps the principal form of solidarity that is required of them amidst the current crises in education. Restoring the chain of transmission of the value of the person, restoring the primacy of human dignity in the formation of the human person is a precious form of social and moral responsibility. Educating and forming new generations in universal solidarity from their earliest years helps them to understand that solidarity is a way of situating oneself in life and in history. Again, I'll repeat, solidarity is a way of situating oneself in life and in history. In this sense, being siblings is the capacity to feel close to, the, to others to the point of suffering with them. Living compassionately means more than occasional gestures of assistance or the mere fact of doing good deeds, since compassion means having the other person's situation at heart. Countering the throwaway culture is also a form of social solidarity because it demonstrates a moral conscience that is sensitive to our common home and the future of humanity. Since effective solidarity always leads to a struggle against poverty and its diverse, and its diverse causes, various forms of ideology inevitably rise up against it. However, 
Putting ourselves at the service of others protects us from ideological distortions, since serving our neighbor means serving real, concrete persons, not just ideas. The right to private property, pardon me, the right to private property, Pope Francis notes, derives from the principle of the universal destination of goods. This was all, already expressed in a clear and direct way by the fathers of the church in the first centuries. If someone lacks what he or she needs, it is because someone else is misappropriating it. You don't often hear this nowadays. If someone lacks what he or she needs, it's because someone else is misappropriating it. In continuity with the teachings of Paul VI and John Paul II, Pope Francis argues that the right to private property is not absolute, but must be considered secondary and derived from the universal destination of goods. If the right to private property, as well, the right, as, well as the rights of the citizens of a state, are rooted in the conviction that the goods of the earth belong to everyone, then each country also belongs to the foreigner. And it is not possible to deny the resources that the earth offers in a given place to a needy person coming from elsewhere. If the criterion of love that transcends the limits of the self is applied to the right to private property and other related rights, then this will have repercussions on how each state functions and on the international relations between them. Indeed, every nation is responsible for the development of other countries and for promoting the integral development of people even beyond their own borders, people who are denied the right to material subsistence and progress. Pope Francis calls on countries with advanced economies to help rather than to dominate countries with emerging economies. In a heartfelt appeal for solidarity so that everyone might have what is necessary to live decently in dignity. Can we not aspire to a world that provides land, housing, and work, terra, techo, trabajo, for all? We can't do that. Can't we not do that? Discerning today's global problems according to the criterion of love means stimulating and accompanying processes, not imposing certain approaches. In this sense, our perspective needs to change and our point of view to shift. We must look at personal freedom through the lens of being siblings, sharing a sense of belonging to one another, and not via the French Revolution's myth of individualism. Likewise, our notion of private property must acknowledge the priority of the right of everyone to access the goods of the earth. So, returning to my assigned title, the word global means all the siblings. That's what the word global should mean, all the siblings. It does not mean the current arrangement favoring a few. It does not mean that. It means all the siblings. Sustainable means to sustain the people and the planet, not just to let the current economic model go on running away with us while propping up current dysfunctional government governance models. Sustainable does not mean maintaining the system we have now. That's not what sustainable is meant to mean. And the word development is development if and only if it means both human, which includes everyone, and caring for the common home. You remember our opening dialogue from Africa? Now let's shift to Jamaica, where the similar question, how are you, often wins a simple answer, one word answer. Keeping. When I first heard it, I found the reply rather modest, nearly regretful, settling for a sort of minimum, 
and not daring to hope for more. But on reflection, I noticed that a more positive sounding answer, like you would expect from a Canadian, like very well or doing fine, maybe seems to imply or require growth, advancement, acceleration. But since there's only one common home, only one planet, then we can't just keep on growing, advancing, speeding faster. And since there's only one human family created by God, we are all siblings and we urgently need to treat each other as such. So drastically summarizing this talk that I am very grateful to have been able to give, when people with good reason say, déjà mieux que l'année qui vient, no matter where it is regretfully uttered, the viable and indeed hopeful alternative is keeping, keeping. For keeping sheds necessary critical light on so-called global sustainable development, totally sums up integral human development and happily vindicates Vatican diplomacy. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, His Eminence, um, for this, this really fascinating and challenging uh, talk uh, that uh, really challenges us to think very deeply about questions of global sustainable development and promoting integral human development. Uh, I want to open the floor uh, to questions. We have about uh, 12 minutes um, to, uh, to answer some questions. I see we've got, I'd said to put them in the chat, uh, but we have a Q&A box as well. So if there are any questions from uh, the audience, please feel free to put them forward. Uh, we do have one question uh, that I will read out uh, from Luke Stocking um, on, uh, on your talk. So I'll go forward with that. Um, and then again, encourage the audience to pose any other uh, questions that you have. I'm so glad to be reminded of our faith's perspective on individualism and freedom. Thank you. If the locus of true freedom is not in the individual, but in our bond as siblings, what institutions or movements in the world, in your view, are best putting this freedom into practice? And how can the church itself best act authentically it, uh, as uh, an institution to promote its view of freedom without reverting to the authoritarian and oppressive practices it has been guilty of in the past uh, and also sometimes in the present as well? Thank you for the question, Luke. So uh, I think that um, the uh, a very neat um, a very neat answer uh, to the first question is, uh, in fact, another principle of uh, Catholic uh, social teaching, namely the principle of subsidiarity. The principle of subsidiarity says that the center of gravity in responding to a problem is uh, best located as, uh, you might say, as low as possible in whatever ladder or chain you want to consider the problem that, that the, the, the lower down the ladder you are, the more authentically uh, and effectively you're going to be in touch with the, both the problem and the solution. And the higher up you go, the more susceptible, like, uh, like any high altitude thing, you're susceptible to the prevailing winds and the cross currents and all that. So um, at the risk of answering a dangerously general question with a, a, a generalization, because I, I don't think I can answer it concretely in, in, uh, as asked, I really feel that, that a criterion that you can use to try to answer the question, to look for viable solutions, is to look for the locus of viable solutions among those who are affected um, and not um, primarily uh, of a, amongst those who, for one reason or another, with one justification or another, are working on the problem on behalf of, and usually without the participation of those who are actually suffering the problem. That, that would be a, a very uh, sort of general answer, which I believe in deeply and which I've learned a lot about in the last 
a uh, few years since the Holy Father brought the um, popular movements to our attention as uh, he, I think he would say, as privileged subjects of the concerns that we're talking about it, uh, today. And uh, if, uh, without criticizing anyone, really without criticizing everyone, if we find it difficult or impossible to include those who live the problems that we're talking about in our conferences, well, that means that we have a ways to go yet. We can't go on talking about these things without the people who are affected by them. And we, we do, and it's not, maybe it's not easy to change that, but it's at least it's a challenge that we should keep posing to ourselves. And the, um, it's very dangerous to ask two questions at once, I must say. What's the second part? I had an answer for it, I know. Uh, so the second part of the question, uh, and how can the church itself oh, yeah. ask okay. authentically? Yeah. There, there. Now there, I, I, think, I think that for the church, uh, and really for the people with the church and the, the, the people that are the church, the, um, uh, it's, to, it's to understand where you might say, what, where again are you locating the word church when, you, when you're asking about the church? And I think that, that in the transition from the first part question to the second, there's a shift from the church as the people of God, the people who are indeed uh, walking uh, through history at God's, from God's creation uh, with God's um, grace and help. Uh, to the um, visible church or the organizational church. And what we are learning uh, slowly since uh, Vatican II is that the institution is not a, itself the subject of many of these most important verbs. The, the correct understanding of church when it's the subject of an important word, verb is usually everybody who's in the church or near the church or willing to be associated with the church. And that the organization or the structure is at the service of that progress, that marching, that uh, pilgrimage through history. That's the generally the, a church that accompanies and a church that um, uh, yes uh, is is is, is uh, walking with is unlikely to do the things that uh, Luke mentioned that we regret and that we are trying to unlearn from doing. And I, maybe I could say that since we're speaking to amongst ourselves as a fairly uh, privileged group of people, maybe people like us can help uh, also by not continuing to project or impose that very uh, hierarchical and institutional uh, reading upon the word church in other words to, to open up our own use of the word so that we notice more than what we do when we are focusing on the high profile spokespeople who like yours truly. Thank you very much. We have a question uh, from uh, Sabrina Chiaferi um, and also a related uh, question from uh, one of our panelists, Severin Dinulen. Um, so I'll read them both. Um, how do we make sure that the that integral human development isn't new saddle on the old horse of colonialism? Um, and she she notes that this has some relationship, I think, to Luke's question and also to your response. Uh, and Severin uh, adds, why is the Vatican emphasizing integral human development um, and not integral ecology, as Laudato, as Laudato Si tends to uh, lump the two together? Yeah, on, uh, on the, actually, the, 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 the second question is easier to answer than the first. First, uh, one thing is that you need to, a question like, like uh, this about an expression or a, a, a term, you have, probably have to do the work of, of checking out the translations first. In other words, this is not... Uh, this might not be a choice made for, you know, for the sorts of important reasons that Severin is acting about, but it might simply be a question of how translators translate and whether, they, um, they're, whether they're translating literally or they're following uh, some other pattern and so on. So there, I, 
My, I, I would say honestly, I tend to use these expressions synonymously and try not to think that 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 there's a um, a an important difference that one should notice. Maybe I'm making a mistake. Maybe there is something that should be noticed, but I don't take that as. I, and I, I don't believe that from, you might say from, uh, from Rome's point of view, that a shift of, of vocabulary or a, a, the addition of another synonym is meant to indicate something uh, that really everyone should pay attention to. So I, I, my own feeling is it's, it's, it's probably, probably not uh, a significant difference. And um, it, I mean, the, the, the first question is, um, I think any wise uh, speaker like myself would turn it back to the questioner because you're dealing with this question in Canada right now in a, in a very intense and focused way. And you know how difficult it is to unpack and to, to uh, adjust um, pre previous uh, understandings and especially misunderstandings and then how uh, the concerns can be well expressed and more and more importantly well acted where well well uh, acted upon in the present and uh, that's why i also said that that with regard to to deja miracle the fact that it's said in in africa means that it uh, refers uh, i think to uh, slavery and colonialism and and i and I said that that it that's uh, and and I experienced that uh, that these are an enormously complex and heavy discussions. They, they, it, there isn't a simple way of saying, well, let's agree on this and then we'll just fly forward. No, these are very hard things to unpack. Very hard things to unpack. And so I don't think I have anything to say except, uh, and this here I'm really quoting Pope Francis. The only real answer. Uh, now I can be uh, borderline dogmatic. The only real answer to that kind of question is dialogue. There, there is no way, there's no short way, there's no uh, academic way, and there's no political way to short circuit uh, ourselves to a quick and happy answer. The only way is dialogue, dialogue, and more dialogue, I think. And I have the impression, the happy impression that, that uh, in, in Canada, uh, there are many attempts and efforts and uh, to do that, and that's just great and necessary and overdue. Thank you. Um, we've got uh, one more question and probably time just for the one more question. Uh, this one comes from Michael Swan. Uh, a current of thought in the Catholic world connects free markets and liberty. If thus, it thus claims that subsidiarity requires the minimizing of the state. Is this sort of Chestertonian Catholicism dangerous, a threat to the goal of uh, Laudato Si and Fratelli Tutti? I think it's um, it, no, it's it's not a threat as such. It's a but it's important that it uh, also be part of the mix in the sense that uh, um, I think uh, the difficulty is that. Uh, is, is again is to maintain the dialogue, maintain the, the, the discussion. And I think we we woke up uh, recently somewhat surprised that uh, the position that uh, that Michael um, sort of sketches in his question. I mean, we we weren't used to this when when I was a kid, or when many of us were kids. Uh, this wasn't part of the like the Catholic landscape, and now it is. Um, so I think we need to talk. And uh, I can't claim that it is easy, but I think uh, I think we need to keep keep the dialogue going, and above all, not sort of uh, what is it? Circle the wagons and say, well, this is the we're we're now circling around the right position, and we're going to keep everybody else at bay. That that's not going to that's not going to help. But uh, I'm not uh, there with you to <laughs> to get involved in the in the give and take. So maybe it's easy for me to say that. Thank you very much, uh, Cardinal, for, uh, for that really fascinating uh, and, as I said, challenging talk. It really, I think, set the tone for the conversation that we're going to be having throughout today and really um, uh, really gave us a lot to, to think about. So thank you very much uh, for joining us today. It, uh, it is much appreciated and, and uh, we're, we're very grateful that you could take the time out to be with us this morning.
or evening uh, where you are now, I think. <laughs> very good. Yeah. Thank you. I'm very happy you invited me. I enjoyed uh, trying to think about what to say and uh, I look forward to hearing what, uh, what others think as well. Great, thank you very much, Cardinal. Um, so we'll take now, it's uh, 10.30 a.m. Uh, Eastern time. And so we'll take a 15 minute break, uh, reconvene uh, in, uh, in 13 to 15 minutes around 10.45 with our first panel uh, on the role of the, uh, the church as a in institutional and diplomatic actor in world affairs and led that to see. Thank you very much. Thank you, Natalie. Um, so we're now going to move to our, our first panel after a really um, compelling keynote speech by Cardinal Cherney. Um, I spoke at the outset about the crisis in global sustainable development. And one of the conversations that we're hoping to have today is to look at the role of the church as an actor in the world, in world affairs. What kind of actor is the uh, church uh, broadly understood? Uh, what, uh, what tools does it have available to promote global sustainable development? Um, in conventional international relations theory, um, the church is not an influential player. Of course, it has no military. It has fairly limited economic resources. Um, I brings to mind the, um, the overuse, perhaps quipped by uh, Joseph Stalin, uh, the Pope, how many divisions has he got um, as, uh, when, when looking at the, the potential role of the church. Uh, yet the Pope has a platform, uh, you know, a platform to influence world affairs and, and conversations uh, like few others. There are networks of Catholics also in the world, Catholic organizations and churches that have avenues to, uh, to influence uh, global, uh, global affairs in a very uh, substantial and broad sense. Um, and this says nothing, um, uh, nothing of the church's highly connected uh, and, and uh, able diplomatic service. And we have an, a, a representative of that service uh, here with us today. Um, the church has often enjoyed considerable soft power in world affairs. That is the power to, to attract others, the power to make others want what you want in, in global affairs. Um, and, um, and so this um, uh, understanding or uh, trying to achieve a better understanding of the, the levers, the capacity of the church to, to influence these important conversations around global sustainable development, uh, particularly at this pivotal moment in history, um, is, uh, is uh, going to be the focus of our first uh, conversation. Um, and I'm really, really excited about this panel, really excited to hear from our three panelists. Uh, I'll introduce all of them briefly, um, just as I did with the Cardinal, the Cardinal not, not doing any justice at all to, uh, to their, uh, their vast um, bios, but, uh, but just to highlight a few things uh, to, to give you a better sense of who's available to us. Uh, Dr. Severin, uh, Severin Dunulin, uh, is the Associate Fellow uh, in International Development in, uh, at the Oxford Department of International Development, that's Queen Elizabeth House, um, and uh, Director of the uh, Laudato Si Research Institute at Campion Hall at Oxford. Um, she has uh, three books, the most uh, recent and, and uh, especially relevant for today is Human Development and the Catholic Social Tradition, uh, published uh, I think it was last year with Routledge uh, Press. Uh, so uh, very uh, excited to, to hear uh, Dr. Denulen's uh, comments. Uh, professor Ma Massimo Fagioli uh, is a church historian and professor, professor of theology and religious studies at Villanova University in Philadelphia. Um, he is uh, a leading historian of Vatican II and, and, and also a leading commentator of uh, church uh, affairs and, and a number of uh, Catholic and, and, uh, and other uh, publications. Um, there are a few uh, better experts uh, about the church, its institutions, its history, its politics. And so um, well, he's got many, many books. Uh, his most recent one uh, covers the liminal papacy of Pope Francis, uh, which came out with Orbis books, um, as well, uh, importantly, on uh, Joe Biden and Catholicism in the United States. Uh, so uh, very uh, excited to have Massimo with us uh, this, uh, this morning. Uh, and finally, uh, Anne Leahy, uh, one of, uh, now retired, but uh, had a career as one of Canada's most distinguished diplomats. Um, she had postings in Brussels and Paris, um, she served as Canada's ambassador in Poland, Russia, with uh, accreditation also in Armenia, Uzbekistan, and Belarus. Um, she was uh, Canada's uh, ambassador to the Great Lakes region of Africa, and, uh, and finally with the, at, at the Holy See in Rome. Uh, she's taught at York University. Uh, she currently teaches at uh, McGill University, focusing on, I think, Catholic social teaching and also uh, the, uh, the role of the church in the world. 
she's a member of the Dicastery for Promoting Integral Human Development. Um, and she's been, uh, frankly speaking about Anne, she's been uh, here uh, since the beginning, since uh, this conference and this whole thing, uh, the idea of uh, focusing on a little bit more on the role of the church in world affairs. She's provided advice uh, through every step of this process. And so I'm enormously grateful uh, to Anne for, for uh, her contribution as well to, uh, to making this all happen uh, today. Um, so I won't uh, speak any further. I, um, I'm looking very much forward to the conversation and I'll open it up and we'll just proceed in alphabetical order with our panelists. I've got a few questions and then we will uh, continue with question and answer. Um, so feel free to, uh, to put your questions in the Q&A box as, as they come to you. Um, and uh, we look forward to that conversation. Um, but first I'll start off um, and, and this will uh, go to uh, Severin um, and, then, and then to Massimo and Anne. Uh, what is the role of the Catholic Church in promoting global sustainable development in a very general sense? Thank you. So I'll, I'll start and I'll probably follow uh, quite a bit on what, um, what Cardinal uh, Michael Turney has, has said. So I would say that a major, role, a major role of the Catholic Church is precisely to change the narrative of global sustainable development. Because as it stands, sustainable development encompasses green growth, net zero, um, but we can continue with business as usual. So the, the role of the Catholic Church here is to propose another narrative, as we have just heard, you know, a narrative of integral human development, of global, meaning all siblings, whether humans or, or endangered species and animals, um, you know, as Francis of Assisi would say, you know, um, sister, sister water. And uh, so these are our siblings too, not, not just humans and emphasizing the narrative of solidarity and, and personal and structural ecological conversion. Uh, and I think that's probably one of the major role of the church is to emphasize this, this role of structural transformation at all levels of society. Um, because this model of development that we call sustainable can create more injustice and destruction. So you know, to take the example of clean energy, as the Western world is pushing for electric cars, this creates demand for more copper, this creates demand for more lithium for the batteries, this creates demand for more um, rare earth minerals. So more mining, more uh, water scarcity, more um, dispossession of land of indigenous people. So this so-called you know, green uh, solution is, is not working either. Um, it does create injustice. And the role of the church is, is precisely to highlight these injustice um, and, this, and these connections too. Uh, so, I would, so to your question, I would say that the role of the church is not to promote global sustainable development, but to witness ecological conversion in all what she does, what she says, uh, what the members do, institutions, businesses, schools, families. And I think, for example, of the, you know, the Laudato Si Action Platform, uh, which invites everyone in the church, families, universities, businesses, parishes, and so on, to really think about an action plan to, to decarbonize and to, to, to enter this process of ecological conversion. So to sum up, I would say the role of the Catholic Church is to fuel a new imagination and creative responses and solutions. It's not about promoting global sustainable development, it's about changing the narrative and, and, and a new, new imagination. And I'll stop here and let, uh, and I'll leave the other questions for later on. Thank you, Severin. Uh, Massimo. Thank you. I totally agree with this and I would add something else. So. As an historian of church institutions, uh, the Vatican, the papal primacy, the papacy, the Holy See, are a unique example of conversion, of their culture, of their uh, projection, of their, of, of their influence um, on the world and in the world. So here there is a symbolic power of the Catholic Church um, and its most visible uh, fusion point, which is uh, in Rome, in, in the Vatican, 
because it's a unique mix of uh, of medieval, of uh, pre-modern, of modern, of, of post-modern, of Italian, very Italian, very Roman, and international, always been international. So this is important because our narrative on the sustainability, on the environment, on the future, uh, tends to be either uh, nostalgic of a pre-industrial era or tends to be futuristic, uh, both for intellectual issues, let's go back to the Council of Trent or something like that, Mm, but also for our political imagination. So here, I believe that the papacy, and especially with, with Pope Francis, we are witnessing the ability to, to understand the world in a unique way. Uh, I, I'm a product, a biographically, of the very secular Italian school system. I, I never went to a Catholic school before being hired by one as a professor. <laughs> but I have discovered that having studied in, in Italy first and then in Germany and, and then in Canada, in, in Quebec, and then working in the United States, that there is a unique Catholic genius in understanding the world. And this genius now uh, is particularly important because it's the, it's, it's the year to those who don't have a voice. Uh, so here I, I, I started as a scholar of the Second Vatican Council. And, there's, and the most interesting uh, painting of Pope John is uh, Salvador Dali's painting of Pope John, which is just an enormous ear. We know that Pope John had a very big ears. So Salvador Dali had this painting of just uh, Pope John's ear. And in the drum of the ear, there's a tiny Virgin Mary. So Dali was, was not probably the, the, the best person to ask advice on moral issues, probably. Uh, but he had this sense of what the church is. Being able to hear and, and interpret. And so this is very much what I see in the role of the church uh, uh, today in this, which is our primary emergency, uh, because all the others, the nuclear, the, they are, uh, they can be stopped much easier than the, uh, the environmental one. So I would say that there is a mix of, of institutional and prophetic uh, dimension in Catholicism uh, that is of in incredibly important value for this issue at this moment. Thank you, Massimo. Anne? Right, well, I'm a diplomat. I'm not a theologian. I haven't written books. So, um, I'll, uh, and I've observed, of course, Vatican Holy See diplomacy and uh, with the nuncio present and certainly Cardinal Turnius, I do not presume to know more than they about the Holy See. Um, I was fortunate to be invited at the presentation of the Motu Proprio in 2016, creating integral human development dicastery. And um, I was struck by uh, the first slide, uh, the foundation, um, which uh, won't come as a news for, for uh, Cardinal Turney, but um, the foundation was the gospel. Um, and uh, the uh, social doctrine of the church and Christian anthropology. And I think that last element is uh, very important. Uh, in terms of the quote-unquote foreign policy of the Holy See, particularly in multilateral settings, particularly at the UN, uh, 
Um, and particularly uh, with everything that concerns human dignity, the foundation for the common good, for all the life issues uh, that are discussed among states in the UN forum. And the church is having a hard time with that uh, because there has been a bifurcation, let's say, fork in the road in terms of the understanding of uh, uh, human anthropology. Um, and I, well, I could talk for a long time about, <laughs> about that, but that is, uh, that is uh, I think, a major issue. Um, the uh, uh, Colonel Turner mentioned the common good, which is not the sum of private goods, certainly not. Uh, it is, uh, if I uh, look at what the uh, catechism teaches, it has three essential elements. One is the fun fundamental rights of the person. The second is at the level of society, i.e. prosperity for the society, but prosperity in terms of spiritual as well as temporal goods. <clears throat> so Massimo, if you've been to Quebec, I live in Quebec, and um, it's very difficult even to get some people to admit that there is a spiritual dimension to the uh, human existence. So we start from there. And the third element is uh, peace and security, of course, among nations, within nations and among nations. So here we have a Russian aggression going on in Ukraine, and no one's mentioned the word peace so far. Um, and that is certainly, I think, uh, as part of salvation of humankind, uh, the number one uh, objective of the Holy See's uh, <clears throat> diplomacy with which every nation uh, should agree. Uh, but I like the definition uh, of peace that uh, is found um, in the uh, 2012 document on Ecclesia in Medio Oriente with I've spoken about Africa, we've spoken about Jamaica, let me speak about a very peaceful place to be the Middle East. So uh, Benedict XVI uh, has this, uh, reminds us that the Hebrew etymology of peace means being complete and intact, restored to wholeness. It is the state of those who live in harmony with God, with themselves, with others, and with nature. We are here in sustainable global development. I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Anne. Um, so we, we talked a little bit about the, uh, the approach of the, the church to the question, even at a conceptual level, and its, um, and its uh, capacity perhaps to challenge the narrative surrounding uh, the prevailing narrative on a global basis surrounding sustainable development. What are the principal means of international influence available to the Catholic Church? Is the church a major uh, or perhaps an underappreciated uh, actor in, in global affairs and global politics? Uh, and how would you characterize this role? Uh, what impact do divisions also within the church uh, play in the church's capacity to exert influence in the direction that, uh, that we've been discussing this morning? Uh, Severin. Yeah, thank you. Well, I will leave the question on international relations and diplomacy aside, uh, but answer um, your question from, from the perspective of development studies and the international influence of the Catholic Church in, within that, that field. And I would say that one major area of influence is by supporting social movements in grassroots organization. That is an influence from the, from the, from the bottom up, you know, from those at the front line of the defense of life in all its forms. So the international influence of the Catholic Church is not so much the, the diplomats, I would say, but it's foremost the countless women and men who are lying down their lives every day for the sake of the gospel, of the protection of life against destruction. And especially, I would say women, you know, we, um, especially you know, the, the nuns which are often for, who are often forgotten uh, in, the, in, the institutional church, in the institutional church, but wherever you go in Latin America, especially as in Africa, in the most remote places, you have these women who are dedicating their lives to, to the margins, and they are the church as much as the, 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 the sorry, uh, Cardinal Cherny, but the Cardinals in, in Rome. Um, and you know, last year alone, you know, according to, to the data gathered by the organization Global Witness, you know, more than 227 land and environmental activists were murdered for defending land, forests, and rivers from destruction. Now, Colombia was at the top of the list, followed by Mexico, then the Philippines, Brazil, Honduras, and the DRC. 
And these numbers are, are estimates and the real numbers uh, are probably much higher and, and this um, doesn't represent all the men and women who are intimidated, who are suffering death threats for, for defending the environment. And so the international influence of the Catholic Church uh, from a development studies perspective is to support these women and men, these grassroots movements who defend life in their territories. Uh, the ones who demand accountability to businesses who are contaminating their water in all impunity. And here, and I would like to hear um, uh, fr uh, from uh, from a diplomat uh, about uh, about Canadian companies overseas, because uh, most of the mining companies in the world are listed in Canada. So, um, how can the church in, in Canada be a kind of voice for for these Canadian businesses who are um, severely disregarding human rights and 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 environmental rights? So and the role of the church is really to accompany these people um, to so, that, so that the government and the businesses respect their rights, their right to free prior and informed consent um, in the face of new infrastructure uh, or extractive industry projects. Now, for example, on the, the REPAM, the, the Red Ecclesial Palamazonica um, is running a human rights tool to help people in the territories affected by so-called development projects to defend their rights. So here is a very good example of, of a church that is supporting these movements by, by um, building capacity in, in defending their rights. And just to sum up, in the words of Cardinal Michael Cherney, you know, the, um, the role of the church is you know, in the discerning today's global problems according to the criteria of love means stimulating and accompanying processes. So really a church that accompanies or to, you know, to, to, to say what, um, what Massimo just says, as just said, it's about listening, about having an ear to, to these, these men and women on the ground who are, who are suffering and who are advocating for, for life to be defended. Thank you, Severin. Yeah. Uh, I, I agree uh, wholeheartedly with, with what Severin said, and this is uh, it has been one of the most uh, moving and important things that we have seen with Pope Francis. Uh, he he's repeated meetings with the uh, conferences of the popular movements. Um, it, it is something that should have happened many years ago, uh, it was Francis that uh, started this. So here, I believe though, that there is also an institutional dimension and, and, and I found interesting the sentence in the, in the Cardinal's lecture, uh, vindicate Vatican diplomacy, because I think this is a, an age that is quite unfavorable to the very idea of, of, of diplomacy. Uh, in different ideological camps, diplomacy is considered a luxury or, or, or ineffective. So it, it's important for, for, for two reasons. One, because we have seen, especially in these last few months, uh, because of Ukraine, what it means to, to have a certain kind of another kind of soft power, which, which used to be uh, assumed, especially after 1991, after the end of, of the Cold War, soft in the sense of uh, persuasion for peace, for coexistence. Well, I mean, soft power can can be used to wage war, as, as we've seen. So the institutional dimension of diplomacy of the Holy See is essential, I believe, to maintain a certain kind of, uh, not corporate, but the co communion culture in the Catholic Church as an actor on, on the international stage. This is, um, it is very important also because we are at a time when uh, raw power, not soft, but raw power is much more, more appealing. 
And so there has to be this uh, being faithful to a, a, an idea that having a, a diplomatic service that speaks to and deal with also sometimes with the most unpalatable of church leaders is essential. It is very important uh, not to be moralistic when we uh, approach world leaders, world issues. And second, very, very briefly, it, it, it's this. It's important because I believe we have discovered that there's no real uh, solution to the climate crisis, to the, the environmental emergency without public authority, public power, state power. And this is, um, it is something that has become controversial also uh, among Catholics. If you have followed just a little bit what has happened during COVID in the United States, the very idea of, of uh, political authorities deciding for the common good was seen as, as an insult to human dignity. So in this, the church, the, uh, the Holy See have a role in reminding that we are going through a crisis of common assumptions on who's in charge of keeping us safe uh, as much as possible from, from the major emergencies to the smallest ones. So the Catholic Church still has a very sound uh, sense of power and, and of authority. And this is very important, especially where Catholics are divided, like in, in the United States, on the very idea of uh, what is government about, what is its, its legitimacy. Um, so... I strongly believe that there is an even, even more important role in a time of crisis. Fascinating uh, remarks and, and touching a little bit on that question of division, and uh, which is so fundamental also to, to action on, on many of these global issues and sustainable development. Uh, Anne? Well, to uh, Massimo's uh, last remark, I would quote Pope Francis, as he said in June 2018, the church's true task is not to change government, but to bring the logic, the logic of the gospel into the thinking and actions of those who govern. So that should take care of whether you should wear a mask in the States or not. <laughs> when you unpack it, of course. Of course, uh, but uh, what uh, I've been asked uh, to um, what I meant by the bifurcation earlier of, of the understanding of uh, Christian anthropology, um, it's a very long uh, discourse one could make, but I would say that just uh, to Massimo's remark also, just the understanding that we no longer have as a common understanding of what is human dignity I think is is uh, is rather uh, disquieting, and um, I think one of the purposes of the diplomacy of the Holy See is when it, it has the opportunity and it uses them uh, to intervene uh, in international organizations. Um, it actually uh, it makes the point. It brings back the point. Everyone is equal in dignity because we are all created. And that, by the way, is uh, also something that is a way of reaching out not only to uh, the Muslim world. I think one of the, it's not the subject this evening, uh, the, today, but uh, the document on human fraternity signed a few years ago um, uh, by the Pope uh, in, a, in Abu Dhabi, I think, is, is remarkable. The, his visit to uh, the Grand Sheikh Al Sistani in Iraq is absolutely remarkable. Um, uh, Michael mentioned the most important issue of fraternity in Canada is certainly getting to understand uh, the, the first peoples in Canada. 
um, and uh, what we have in common is God the creator and what God the creator gives us is that we're all equal in human dignity, not human dignity and autonomy and productive value for the economy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so uh, when I meant bifurcation and the understanding of uh, Christian anthropology, this is one of the uh, points I had in mind. Thank you. Um, and so, so to take this perhaps a step further in terms of the uh, the broader sustainable development agenda, um, which has faced some real challenges in recent years, particularly since the pandemic, but now we're entering, I think, a uh, a phase of uh, of increasing division in the international system, a phase of uh, perhaps growing geopolitical competition that has the potential to have very important ramifications. Uh, for the sustainable development agenda and more broadly for the lives of the uh, the world community. And so uh, what role can the church play in reinvigorating this agenda in this now uh, perhaps increasingly fractious global context? Uh, Severin. Yeah, so obviously many of the SDGs are, are, are part of integral ecology um, of Laudato Si, you know, such, as, such as reducing poverty in all its forms, zero hunger, good health and well-being, quality education, clean water, clean energy, responsible consumption and production, decent work, in it, reducing inequality, climate action, gender equality, and so on. So if one does uh, through the SDGs one by one and Laudato Si, uh, we'll find a lot of, of similarities. Um, but the church goes in some ways beyond the SDG agenda, uh, as I said already before, not only by, by seeing them as holistic uh, and indivisible, and um, that all the SDGs are to be pursued together, not one at the expense of the other, um, but also it emphasizes the urgency of structural transformation. In some ways, the SDGs could be uh, reach um, in or with our contemporary economic systems, but that's not that's not something sustainable in in the long term. So what um, what the church I think is is emphasizing is that these SDGs cannot be reached without a profound conversion at the personal and the structural level. So there's some of this metanoia of turning around. Um, and so in seeking to embody God's love for creation and in every aspect of life in it. I think probably going back to, to the quote that, that Anne was saying that now the task of the church is to bring the gospel to, to, to those who are making decisions uh, and including ourselves and, and, and church institutions. And it's a long process, even to start with, with the church of the church. Uh, I think it was Paul, was it Paul VI in Evangelii Nutandi, uh, who said that um, the world doesn't need discourses, what it needs is witnesses, and to start with the church. Um, and, and it is difficult to just look at you know, how much does the church own, uh, how much land does it possess, its buildings, the way it operates. Um, and so yes, yeah, so going back to the theme of, of conversion at all levels of of the church um, and its institutions. Thank you, uh, Massimo. The question of the increasingly disrupted international order is very important for the church. And I believe that there are several levels to this. The first one is that um, especially in light of the war in Ukraine and of the fact that uh, major countries in the world where Catholicism is very important have taken no position on that war says something on the questions that Catholicism as a global church will face. So this is a big transition from a church that was dominated uh, by Europeans and North Americans, the uh, NATO Catholicism in some sense, to a more global. And, and this is theologically very necessary. Uh, we, we are late to the development. There are also questions what that means for the geopolitical postures 
of, uh, of Catholic churches globally that may not align in the ways they used to be more aligned during the Cold War, uh, that, uh, that, that remains to be seen. But this is not just a problem of the churches of, in the global south. If you just look at what has happened in Italy, my own country, since February 24th, the immersion of very, in my opinion, uh, sinister pro-Russian sentiments that are rooted in the memory that Russians defeated Hitler as if things uh, are not more complicated. So, I mean, that's Italy. Uh, Rome, the Vatican, they coexist in the same physical space, geographical area. So this uh, disruption of uh, the geopolitics of Catholics is happening everywhere. I mean, just look at the United States. The pro-Trump and, and, and pro-Putin Catholicism. So this is a very big question, a, a very long uh, set of questions. Now, a second uh, chapter is this, that this, this crisis of, of the international order happens at, at a time of the twilight, the e e eclipse of state power as the unique uh, locus of authority. We know that the Vatican has started already having relations with international non-state actors. I wonder if and when will happen that the Vatican, the Holy See, as a, a, an ambassador to, to Silicon Valley, an, an ambassador to Apple, an ambassador, because this, I mean, Sam, it, it sounds like a joke, but they are much more relevant than many states already. So we are in the middle of an enormous uh, transition, not just in the alignments of who is with whom, but on who is on this, this, uh, this chessboard, uh, moving pieces. And so here Catholicism, I believe, um, as a certain kind of antennas that makes it sensitive and receptive to, to this, also because Catholicism has a very critical view of capitalism ever. It has a, always been allergic to nationalism, philatism, and so Catholicism has resources which doesn't mean that we can convince Catholics to vote in a certain way or to, or to throw out of power some leader. But it means that there is a vault, a treasure of, uh, of sensibilities, of, of ideas that I'm not sure can be found uh, easily elsewhere. Uh, in, at, at, at this juncture. A really uh, fascinating comments, Massimo, on the, on the international order and the split, and it brings to mind many aspects of uh, network diplomacy and mechanisms of influence that are less centralized, but still uh, highly influential. Um, we'll go with uh, Anne. I think I've got nothing to add. <laughs> So we'll, we'll dive, I've got one more question um, uh, beforehand, and then uh, I see that we've got some questions in the, in the Q&A, and this is just going to, to lean a little bit further into this current international co uh, conflict in, in Ukraine. It has really been a shock to, uh, to the international order. It's in a way shaken the ground upon which uh, uh, Holy See diplomacy and, and international diplomacy more generally um, as well as international development has, uh, is, is based upon, uh, we see real divisions and frankly dysfunction in the United Nations, particularly within the Security Council, 
Um, we, you know, we see Russia invading a, a, a country while it's chairing or, or it's presiding over the Security Council. Uh, we see real implications for uh, proliferation um, and uh, particularly of nuclear weapons, massive modernization of nuclear arsenals, uh, uh, pretty, pretty clear threats and nuclear saber rattling, the recognition that Ukraine has surrendered nuclear weapons in, in, uh, in exchange for peace guarantees and those nuclear, uh, many uh, observers have noted that that other countries may be wondering whether Ukraine would have been invaded had it retained those weapons, and so um, there are real uh, challenges to the uh, to uh, both the disarmament and non-proliferation. These are issues that the church has been uh, has been very active on, and they have very uh, important implications as well for the broader sustainable development agenda. And so. Um, how uh, uh, and we are joined by the cardinal who who uh, recently made uh, made a visit to uh, to the region and, and represented uh, the pope. So how does the church uh, respond to this this era of of uh, of, of moving chess pieces and and, and real uh, dynamism in terms of uh, global relations? And, and dynamism I don't mean with a positive connotation. Um, there are there are some real unsettling trends, and so would be very interested in our panelists' uh, perspective on where uh, this global agenda goes. Uh, in this uh, in this now fractious, more fractious international context. Uh, Severin. Yeah, I think what Cardinal uh, Marshall Chen is probably much more um, uh, adequate to answer that question than than, than me. Um, but to, I would just answer with with what two points. One is the answer to, to your question depends on you know uh, what is the church here. Now, is it the church as, as a holy see? Is it the church as the people of God? Um, is it the church in its leadership? And and so the the answer to the question will will depend on, on how we answer who is the church here. And I think that probably permeates the whole of the discussion this afternoon about the role of the church. Um, what do we mean by that? You know, is it the institution? Is it the, the prophetic? Is it is it the laity? Or you know, um, so I think that would probably be worthy of discussion later on. Um, but one one thing that I would say the Ukraine crisis is, is revealing is our dependence on gas and oil. And I think specifically of non-Germany's economy that is so dependent on Russian gas. I mean, you've all seen the statistics about how much the European Union pays every day to Russia. Um, and I remember it's about $130 billion or something like that. So what Russia receives every day in terms of, of, of our, uh, you know, our, uh, our, uh, our buying of, of oil and gas is, is even much more than what it spends on the war in Ukraine. Um, and so I think there has probably been a wake up call, especially for us in Europe, of that dependency. Um, and so as individuals, yeah, we're trying to you know, turn our heating down and, and really think differently about this dependence on, on gas and oil and also willingness to make sacrifices. And I know there's a big debate that's going on in Germany to what extent can the German population make sacrifices for the sake of um, turning off the tap of the, this, this income that goes every day into Russia. Um, and then also, of course, the the, uh, the anti-war protests and 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 the and the, the arms trade and uh, uh, you know if if only the Catholic Church could be as vocal about the arms trade as it is about abortion, I think we would probably be in a different place. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, thank you for that and and really interesting comments on and potentially the alignment with the global security agenda and and perhaps the sustainable development agenda are aspects of that. Uh, leading, um, you know, with the recognition in, in Europe and elsewhere that um, we are very literally funding the bombs that are dropping on on Ukraine at the moment, and so um, it's a it's a pretty dramatic realization I think that that is spread through uh, much of the world. Uh, Massimo, very interested in your your comments as well, talking uh, you know about perhaps the transition from a NATO Catholicism to uh, which I, I underlined in my notes here as a, as a compelling uh, uh, point. I, I never heard it quite, quite like that. Um, be interested in your thoughts on on this uh, geopolitical context. I agree that this war uh, gives a sense of urgency to the need of a, the transition to a, a different model of uh, energy supply and sources. But as an historian here, uh, I would say two things. First, because I believe the war in Ukraine is a major turning point for the 
in European history, in world history, and for Catholicism, especially for two reasons. The first one is this, that during the, the Cold War, the Cold War had made some common assumptions which uh, was of uh, a certain stability of, uh, of state borders, uh, or a, um, a rejection and of an unacceptability of attempts of uh, nationalistic ethnic revenge in Eastern Europe, which is our problem now. So, I don't know if we are going back to a Cold War. I don't see this. I see a, a situation that is more like the, the 1930s. Second is this. I believe that the war in Ukraine is for Catholicism more shocking, more a surprise than, than it was 9-11. In some sense, Catholicism, the Holy See, saw what was going to happen with 9-11 already 10 years before with the, the first Iraq war. If you read some of the most uh, smart observers of the, the Middle East in Catholicism, in 1990-91, they said the US invasion of Iraq will unravel completely the situation. And, and so then, as in 2001, 9-11 did not come as a total surprise for, for Catholicism. Ukraine now is more, is more surprising. Also because it opens uh, a series of, of issues within Catholicism uh, with, with Greek Catholics and so on. So I believe that uh, this is an, an extremely complicated situation that uh, it is essential to have for the Holy See a diplomatic core. Uh, I believe that there is uh, an added value of having someone like uh, the figure of the, of the, of the Secretary of State uh, because this is something that uh, uh, makes us see the difference between uh, Catholicism uh, adopting a certain kind of posture, but also of style between Catholicism and other churches. That is very necessary. Uh, the mistakes were made because it's a very complex situation. But I believe that the most important thing is that this war says very clearly that this is not just uh, a minor event, but it's what Pope Francis has been talking about since 2014, uh, piecemeal World War III, and especially since 2017, when he started saying, I, I'm reading books about the 1930s, because this is where we, we, we're going. And five years ago, he saw that, and I believe there was a great insight. Thank you, Massimo. And you've served both as our ambassador in Russia. You have a, a unique uh, perspective on, on what's happening there, and, and you've been in Poland, in the region, and in the Holy See. Uh, very interested in your perspective on this question. And I'll defer also to the Apostolic Nuncio, who knows Moscow just as well as I do, if not much better. <laughs> um, I, just a few observations. Um, I was listening to a Foreign Minister Lavrov's press conference this morning with the, the Secretary General of the UN. And it just brought home to me even more forcefully what then Foreign Minister Primakov was saying in the uh, mid 1990s. It's a multipolar world. The order is different now. Lavrov this morning was pointing out how many uh, states had abstained or made sure they were out of the room when the vote came in the UNGA to condemn Russia's aggression. You know, it doesn't have the same resonance in, 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 in China or India or Costa Rica or South Africa. 
uh, you know, this is a, it's a European thing. Um, it's, it, you know, it's, it, it's not as ominous as it would have been at any time, probably in the 20th century. In other words, Europe is getting relativized in a way. That's, that's one thing. I, I'm not saying that aggression is the next best thing, but I'm saying, you know, this is not the world of 1930s. It's not the one of 1990s. This is looking ahead the 21st century. And, uh, you know, the 55 countries in Africa have their own identity. They have a different perspective and it's, it's not, uh, it's not it's not as ominous in a way for them as as it was uh, it would have been uh, when the OSCE was being put together. Um, it's interesting that you mentioned the uh, stability of borders because the the conference in Geneva that led to the Helsinki Agreement and the OSCE was actually an initiative of the Soviet Union of Brezhnev precisely to uh, stabilize the borders of the Cold War uh, after the Second World War. Um, and what we see today is the president of Russia wishing to relive the Russian Empire and therefore the question is where will he stop at the Buk River or will he uh, go back uh, to uh, the, the steppes of Finland or go back to parts of Poland. Uh, that, that's the, the question that no one has the answer to and no one wants to push the issue too far because of nuclear weapons. Now there is one pope who has really talked a lot about stopping the arms trade and that is one Pope Francis. Uh, so maybe the church hasn't been vocal, but he certainly has uh, since he's become Pope at every occasion. Uh, there is one interesting, uh, another interesting element. This is a bit un uh, ordre dispersé, but nevertheless, um, uh, one of the great strengths, uh, dear Nuncio of the Holy See diplomacy, is the, the, the capacity to provide good offices, to act as a mediator, because you, the Holy See does not have temporal interests, it's not peddling arms and it's not selling visas, uh, so therefore it can uh, and it is called upon to, to mediate. There have been calls by some for a role of the Holy See to be played in the context of the current aggression. What complicates, and here I'm going out on a limb, but I take it entirely personal responsibility. <laughs> the one complicated factor here is that the Holy See is not totally disengaged because of the Ukrainian Greco-Catholic Church, uh, which is quite present uh, in the Western part of, uh, of Ukraine. And here is an interesting uh, element because uh, it not only does it give uh, the Latin church uh, a stake um, in terms of the Catholic uh, community. It also involves the number one, I would think, the number one priority of any Pope, which is that the church be one, that Christ asked for in the gospel, that the church be one. Therefore, ecumenism, breathing with two lungs, uh, Gorbachev wanted a, a, a house uh, bringing East and West, and John Paul II wanted to breathe with two lungs, the Eastern and the, uh, the Western churches. So that is an, a, a complicating factor, and um, we could go on for a long time to talk about that, um, but I'm sure, uh, well, I wouldn't want to be in Rome right now designing the diplomacy on that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um... So uh, we've got uh, a number of questions from the audience. Uh, we'll start off with uh, one from Agnes Richard. Uh, would a nationally uh, uh, coordinated dialogue to address integral human development in Canada be helpful? If so, how can all iterations of the Catholic Church in Canada work together with emphasis all in caps uh, to engage in dialogue with oppressed people here Indigenous victims of ecological degradation, inequality in income, healthcare and opportunity, and those oppressed by Canadian interests abroad. These currently seem to be minimal mechanisms to include, there seems, uh, currently seems to be minimal mechanisms to include the efforts of everyone in a national dialogue. Some of this came up in, in one of the early remarks from Severin. Um, and so I, I open the floor to, uh, to any of our three panelists uh, to come in on Agnes's question. I think it's that if I leave those more familiar with the Canadian reality. I'm, I'm just saying one very brief thing. 
it, it's very well known that uh, Laudato Si uh, and all the uh, teaching of Francis on the environment time has been seen as, as a, as a non-starter for uh, many leaders of the church in the United States. So this is a, a real problem. Interestingly, is the teaching that my young students have heard the most about. There's a little disconnect here between the, the teaching of their pastors and what they have heard, because that's relevant for, for, for them. I, I, I don't know if it applies to, to Canada, to other countries, but certainly this is what I have seen uh, from multiple sources in the United States. Um, maybe perhaps Cardinal Cherney, uh, we, we kind of gave him the time off now, but, uh, but uh, happy to very much draw him back into the conversation because um, some of this might have come also from uh, in response to his remarks because it came in over the break. In any case, all I was going to say is that it seems to me that the, pan the second panel is going to answer this question. So that's, that would be my proposal is, to, is, is in a sense to, to listen to the second panel answering the question, which I think has been very well formulated. Yeah, that sounds like a, like a good way forward. Thank you. Uh, um, just a quick question from Susan Tomlinson uh, for Massimo. Um, he asked if the Pope John that you're referring to is uh, Pope John the 23rd. Yes, the real one, not the, the anti-Pope of the 14th century with the same name. So it, it's, yes, Pope John the 23rd, 1958, 1963, the one who called Vatican II. Uh, so yes, it's it's him. Thank you, Massimo. Uh, we have a question from uh, Raymond Lafontaine. Uh, could you uh, clarify the distinction and the connections between the Holy See's role in reaching out to those who exercise secular authority, states, and those who exercise religious authority, uh, local religious leaders, Catholic Orthodox, and other faiths that could influence policy in a remote way? And how does this apply to the current situation in Ukraine? Uh, and if any of the panelists would like to uh, come in on this question. That would be a question for the nuncio. <laughs> <laughs> we'd be happy. Yeah. I, I know we've only asked the nuncio for, for closing remarks, but if you'd like to come in, uh, please do, uh, Your Excellency. So I'm certainly, you know, in, I'm an active diplomat on a, on a full featured mission Pro country and make uh, any statement that could be uh, that could be understood improperly. It's not uh, it's not real. Um, we have uh, how to say discipline in our diplomacy that we know what we have to do, but we also know what we don't have to do. So it means so. I think this is. I have been serving in Eastern Europe for. 15, 16 years. I was ambassador to Holy See to Belarus for four years. I was ambassador of Holy See Nuncio to Ukraine for seven years. And I was ambassador to Moscow for five years. So it means uh, I don't want to enter in a, the days that a question that will be always um, complicated to see at this stage in its, uh, its, its really meaning. Probably, unfortunately, what can I say, we are still at the beginning, and that is the saddest story, you know. So I don't think I will refrain from making more free or... Ref but it is uh, really complex. I think what Professor uh, Professor Fajoli said, uh, it is certainly... Very, and what also Madame uh, Ambassador Lee said, it's also reflecting and throwing light what we are living today, but I don't think we know exactly what we are going to face, let's say, in one month's time from now. And it is very touchy and dramatic and sad and lamentable. And certainly the Holy See will certainly try to do something that can be done. But as you know, know that uh, as a mediator or as a promoter of, uh, but this is Cardinal Czerny who would, could say much more because he's also closer to the mood that is um, 
uh, say the conversation that are in the Vatican, it is impossible to see uh, any any capacity of being a, being a facilitator of solutions if there are not uh, exceptions for two parties. And the acceptance here is not that easy still. No? So it's not just to say something, ideas there are many, but it must be general acceptance and popular feelings are different and uh, we are in front of a major tragedy. And so it's, don't think it is time to make any final assessment. So you understand me, you know, that I'm avoiding to say what I'm not supposed to say. Thank you so much. So I will continue. I'm very much enjoying what you say because this is also giving to me this uh, uh, insight to what is a Canadian uh, Canadian public, Canadian inter uh, universities, um, whether uh, what, is, what is the feeling of uh, an attitude or, but you know, um, it is probably the, the worst thing is that we are at the beginning and we have to wait to see and see whether we can be really useful. Pope is very willing to be useful, but as you said, no, seems that even he sees that in a certain moment, it's better to wait for another moment, for another time, for another period. So, thank you. Thank you for that. Would anybody else like to uh, come in on, on this point? Uh, Cardinal Cherney. Oh, I, I will uh, follow the very good example of uh, a senior and experienced diplomat, whereas I'm uh, just uh, a youngster in all of this, as you all can see. Um, uh, just uh, two things. One is um, you're focusing on uh, diplomacy, but uh, the uh, uh, the Holy Father is first of all the Bishop of Rome, and the first among all the bishops. And uh, in that sense, uh, he is also the uh, Bishop of the Russians. It's not just the bishops of the of the Ukrainians or the Western Europeans and so on. So um, it's, uh, I think when trying to uh, parse uh, the diplomacy, uh, we mustn't just say, well, now we will uh, separate the diplomacy from the religious leadership uh, or the spiritual leadership. And no, no, that doesn't make any sense either. And he would never do that. And uh, we would never do that. So, uh, so uh, we have, uh, if we want to talk about mediation or good offices, we have uh, here uh, someone who is uh, uh, someone and uh, something which is uh, which is integrally and intrinsically related to both parties in the conflict. Unusual for a mediator, honestly. I think we should keep that in mind, and maybe it's a hopeful thing to say. Not not a it's not an obstacle. And the other thing is, if I could repeat what the Holy Father said, and the, uh, Archbishop Yurkovic already mentioned it, but I don't think he put it as strongly as it was uh, originally. He said that the Holy See was ready to do what it could or something like that. He, he said, I think the Holy Father actually said well, the Holy See is willing to do anything, anything, anything. In fact, I remember it because it was the uh, the uh, Angelus at which he said that, uh, uh, that the two of us cardinals were actually going. So that's why I remember clearly what he said. Do anything to help. Uh, so uh, this is not an answer, it's just a more a question of an attitude or a spirit that I think we should have in order to appreciate what might happen and, and to help it happen and to pray for it if we can pray. And, and, and that is, um, some of us are old enough to remember ping pong diplomacy. It's a, and and uh, the thing that I find helpful about ping pong diplomacy is, is it, its total implausibility. At a time when we thought we were up against a, a completely insurmountable obstacle, something as silly or as trivial or as foolish sounding as ping pong seems to have helped make the breakthrough happen. So I just leave that as a thought for our imagination and our, and our prayer. And Well, yes, just to build on that and also answering a question from an anonymous attendee um, and there is a parallel with John the 23rd and his role uh, in the Cuban Missile Crisis and that fits into let's do anything that can help 
and exchange of messages is one. Uh, Pope John Paul um, used messages as as uh, as a hook, really, uh, for the uh, for Nikita Khrushchev actually to to come back to him. Um, and uh, it's interesting the text of the message uh, of the Pope to Pat Patriarch Kirill for Orthodox Easter. Um, it, it, the openings are there, the words chosen are there. I mean, the, 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 as we say in French, is dans les perches. Uh, that's, that's one of the ways that diplomacy can work. Thank you, Diane. Any other, anybody else want to come in on this question? Uh, otherwise, we'll get to uh, Brian McDonough's question. Okay, uh, so Brian is asking, how can the institutional church um, have an impact in countering the increased concentration of power into the hands of very few people, the richest person? Uh, for example, uh, social media, technology, etc. Some of these very powerful figures, especially in the United States, identify themselves as Catholic. Anybody want to take a stab at, at that one? It's interesting that the assumption in our culture is that equality is a fundamental value, uh, except when it's about wealth. There's a I, I, I was talking about that with, with, with my students yesterday. You're all outraged because of inequality in the church, gender, clergy, and so on. But that one individual has $44 billion to buy something that he doesn't register, really. And, and they admit to that. So I believe there is a, a prophetic message that has to be sent. Um, in some countries, this message is particularly unpopular these days. Uh, I, 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 I think it would be good to exert some pressures on, on some bishops that are particularly comfortable with feeding that, that kind of, of, uh, of, uh, of, of disconnect that there is in, in Catholic culture on obscene wealth being, being okay. Uh, I'm talking about U.S. bishops here, uh, without naming names, but but you 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 can do a search very easily. <laughs> so uh, it's an internal problem of of the church in some countries also. Does anybody else want to uh, take a stab at this question? Uh, very real implications, I think, for for environment and sustainability of these these perverse concentrations of wealth. Um, so, uh, so some uh, some uh, environmental angles as well to that aspect. If I um, can say, uh, well, this question hasn't been explored at all. I think you know, the role of the church in reducing inequality is um, is not researched in the same way as the role of the church in reducing poverty. Um, and and yes, I think you're right, Massimo, that the chair has been very cautious uh, in entering that field. And though we have some pronouncement, especially by Pope Francis, and uh, Cardinal Cherny reminded us about you know, the social role of private property. And um, Pope Francis doesn't mean his words about an economy that kills, and he has also strong, strong words about inequality, um, which has been opposed, as we know, by by wealthy people. There is probably some um, prosperity gospel as well latent in, in the Catholic Church. Um, but I just want to, to, to say something that, um, that someone uh, who is a member of REPAM said in some of the interviews that we did for a, a research project that, um, that uh, we are currently involved in. He said the church has had lots of schools uh, throughout the world, but is not involved in the economy. The church doesn't have cooperatives. Um, you know, the church criticizes an economic model that creates inequality, but doesn't have an, another economic model. 
I don't know, we have in Spain, you had the Mondragon and the cooperative movement. I think mainly in Europe, you have the cooperative movement that's been probably, you know, pioneered by the Quakers and then you know, the Catholics came on board, especially in France and Germany in the late 19th century. Um, but uh, but for the moment, we, we don't have much. Yes, we have the economy of Francesco, uh, but it's not the same, I would say, depth or, or probably the same influence as the 19th century, um, you know, Catholic businessman uh, pioneered in terms of the this kind of alternative economic model. Thank you. Um, we've got a question from John Williams. Um, could we hear some specific examples of how the church is or is not reducing its environmental footprint? For example, uh, why did a large delegation of Indigenous and non-Indigenous uh, bishops fly uh, to Rome when the Pope could and hopefully will come uh, to visit Canada to make uh, an apology? Um, so are there any steps that, uh, that the church has taken to, um, to uh, perhaps more actively uh, fulfill and reduce its environmental footprint? Well... <laughs> Well, the specialists are thinking uh, in Quebec, uh, there is, I think in Canada even, there's the network of green churches, Les Églises Vertes, uh, and it's in the, with the principle of subsidiarity. It starts at the local level. Every uh, parish or diocese looks at what it can, what measures it can implement within its means to, uh, to uh, reduce its, uh, to, to become more sustainable, in other words. So, that's one little element. In terms of the indigenous peoples, that's a it's a completely different uh, question, and I would say that uh, they led the way. <laughs> um, and um, in fact, it's a reminder that in Laudato Si, uh, there is a uh, there are some there's a part that deals with the contribution, in fact, of indigenous peoples to uh, sustainability uh, looking into the, the future. Does anybody else want in? If not, uh, we've got one final question um, from, uh, from a, a participant and then we'll, uh, we'll wrap up this panel. If I can say there are initiatives about looking at the footprints of the diocese and the religious order and the Jesuits in Britain and they're looking um, very closely at the environmental footprints and how to be carbon neutral, uh, which is a huge enterprise. It's not just the travel, but also the buildings, um, the way we operate and the same at the diocese level. And I don't know whether in Rome things are also changing. Um, and I don't know whether it's also linked to the decentralization of the church. You know, why should everyone fly to Rome as opposed to decisions being made more the, at the local level could be a way forward. Um, and probably the pandemic has revisited uh, the way we travel, the way we work. Um, yeah, thank you. Okay, and uh, the a final question uh, from Michael Dallaire. Uh, does not the model of the church as a field ho hospital uh, serve as a more appropriate model for these times? Um, and I'm going to extrapolate in terms of uh, global development issues as well as, um, as, well as the uh, potentially in a world of a more fractious world of conflict. Um, uh, so uh, we'll go to the panelists from, uh, for that. I believe that it's even more important uh, that metaphor, that, that image of the church as a field hospital. Uh, one problem that maybe wasn't so evident when Pope Francis talked about that for the first time in September 2013, it's that the church itself has become sometimes on, on some issues a battlefield. This is something that in 2013 was not so evident, and it's not Pope Francis' fault. But this is what we have seen in these last nine years. Uh, so that metaphor is even more relevant, but uh, it must be applied to the church itself, um, I think.
Okay. Um, we've got just a quick question also, uh, since Massimo uh, from Tony Hodge, uh, or for uh, Ms. Leahy, excuse me. Um, could you uh, repeat the reference to Pope Benedict's definition of peace? It is in the report uh, Ecclesia in Medio Oriente of 2012, um, from memory. Uh, it's his definition of peace. I, I don't have the exact uh, paragraph, but it's uh, where he defines peace according to its Hebrew etymology. Um, thank you all very much for uh, for really interesting discussion, broad ranging discussion on issues of sustainable development, but also reaching more broadly. We've had a couple of unexpected contributors to our panel, uh, both uh, um, His Eminence and and, uh, and his uh, and His Excellency uh, chiming in at a couple of points, which was an opportunity that I wasn't expecting, but I'm delighted uh, was uh, was made possible uh, through uh, through this uh, a really interesting conversation discussing of the role of the church and the Holy See in the world and diplomacy and promoting uh, a conception of integral human development. So, uh, so I really took a lot away from the discussion and I hope all of you did as well. Um, we now have a 30 minute uh, break. Um, uh, so we'll be reconvening at 1230. Hopefully you'll be able to grab a quick bite to eat if you're, you're in North America um, and um, uh, in, in this time zone of lunchtime. Um, we have a really exciting panel in the second half, and I think a lot of the, the threads of the conversation will, uh, will weave in terms of the role of uh, individual Catholics and Catholic organizations uh, to, uh, to, uh, to really realizing uh, sustainable development or integral human development. Uh, and we've got four uh, excellent panelists as well to join us. Uh, and Father John Meehan will be, will be moderating that, which will also be a treat to, to have him uh, on uh, and involved in the, in the event as well. Uh, so please uh, do stick with us uh, for, uh, for 30 minutes uh, or uh, come back in 30 minutes. And I'm really looking forward to that panel and to the discussion. So thanks again to, uh, to our three uh, distinguished panelists uh, today for uh, they've been very generous with their insights and uh, fully engaged in this process throughout so I'm uh, enormously grateful to them as well as to our two unexpected panelists uh, additions to the panel um, that's uh, also wonderful to uh, to have them and, and great that they've been uh, with us for so much of the day so uh, so thank you all very much I hope you all have a nice lunch and see you in less than 30 minutes thanks thank you Michael <laughs> thank you. okay Okay, well, welcome everybody uh, back. I hope that you had a nice, a nice lunch, um, a brief lunch in, in this case. Um, really looking forward to the panel in the second half. I'm uh, very happy uh, and delighted to be uh, joined by uh, Father John Meehan, uh, who's going to be uh, moderating and chairing the, the panel in the second half. Uh, welcome, John. Thank you very much, Michael. And uh, it's been wonderful to collaborate with you on this project and uh, with the folks at Norman Patterson and at the University of St. Michael's College. Um, hello, everybody. And uh, my name is Father John Meehan. I'm a Jesuit and currently director of the Bill Graham Center for Contemporary International History at the University of Toronto. And it's my pleasure to uh, moderate this panel, which builds on the uh, Cardinal Turney's talk this morning and the session on uh, the church to really look at the laity and what can lay people do to get involved um, on the whole issue of, of sustainable development, or as Cardinal Turney called it, integral human development. Um, before I make a few general comments on that, uh, I'd just like to uh, introduce our panel. And as you see, uh, this panel really draws from the world of academia, but also um, the world of activ activism as well, uh, public policy, and so I think we'll have a good mix in this panel of the academics meeting the uh, people who've been kind of doing the uh, grassroots type of work in this area. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce, uh, first of all, uh, Dr. Peter Baltudis, um, who is the Associate Professor of History and Religious Studies at St. Mary's University in Calgary, as well as the CW, CWL Chair for Catholic Studies. Uh, I've known Peter for many years. We're both historians by training. Uh, Peter's work has been on uh, modern European history, uh, but his doctorate is actually um, the first historical and theological examination of development and peace, uh, which, as you know, is the uh, Catholic um, International Development Agency. Um, so he brings together a, a, a theological training with a historical training. Um, and he's also President General of the Canadian Catholic Historical Association. So uh, welcome, Peter, to the panel. 
And we look forward to uh, hearing your insights uh, on, uh, uh, on that from the academic side. Um, also on our panel, I'd like to introduce one of my co dear colleagues, Jenny Cafiso, and uh, also known Jenny for many years. She's the executive director. Uh, probably she needs no introduction to many of you. Uh, she's the executive director of CJI, Canadian Jesuits International. And she has a whole lifetime of experience working in that sector. Uh, prior to becoming CGI director in 2003, she worked many years with JRS, Jesuit Refugee Services, based in Rome, uh, where she was international programs coordinator. Um, she's traveled extensively for her work through Asia, Latin America, and Africa, and has a, an MA in political science. Um, next to her, we have Joe Gunn. Uh, Joe, again, needs probably no introduction to many of you as the uh, somebody who spent a lifetime, again, in social justice work, uh, starting with working class, working class roots in Scarborough, if that's right, Joe, uh, where you uh, got involved with the Catholic Youth Movement and uh, uh, with the, in the Archdiocese, um, leading to work with refugees from Chile and Mexico initially, um, did a BA in political science here in Toronto, but MA in at the University of Regina and uh, another place where I've worked. So uh, I, I appreciate that as well. Uh, but, and then from there, uh, spent time seven, seven years in Central America, uh, working with refugees in the camps during a very turbulent time, as we know, of war and massive displacement in countries like El Salvador, Honduras and Guatemala. After that, he was at the CCCB, Canadian Conference of Catholic Bishops, for more than 10 years as Director of Social Affairs, Chair of the Aboriginal Rights Co Coalition, and has done extensive work uh, with, uh, as, with Kairos, uh, which many of you would know uh, as one of the founding vice chairs. And then last but not least, we have uh, John Malloy, and I don't know, John, how to introduce you. Uh, you've, you have an academic uh, role, but also extensive role in politics um, as a Liberal member uh, in the Ontario Legislative Assembly. Um, a doctorate in Modern History from Oxford. Um, probably many of you uh, are familiar with John's work uh, in, he's published uh, on the role of Catholics and laity in changing the church. So how ordinary Catholics can get involved in playing a role in changing the church. And that's very much the topic of this panel. As we heard this morning from Cardinal Cherney, um, Catholic social teaching, um, although it has roots going back to Leo XIII, really we have so much to thank this Pope for, uh, especially in Laudato Si and Fratelli Tutti. And I particularly appreciate how um, Cardinal Cherney uh, talked about, uh, <laughs> it was a wonderful image from Fratelli Tutti, siblings in social friendship and how we use that to redefine the concepts of liberty, fraternity, and equality uh, on something that uh, goes a little bit deeper than the Enlightenment um, values that have led to a type of individualism that he says has not made us more equal, more free, and more fraternal. Um, so I, I'd like, to, uh, I think we'll just turn it over now to uh, our panelists to answer a very basic question, and that is, what is the role of the laity? in promoting um, what the Cardinal called integral human development. And each panelist will have five minutes to answer that kind of overarching question. Maybe uh, John, we'll start with you on that one. Great, well, uh, thank you very much. And I so appreciate being on this uh, panel with so many distinguished people and having listened to the wonderful conversation this morning. Uh, it's probably no surprise when you hear my background that I'm gonna approach this question from a political perspective. I'm a former uh, politician, maybe a recovering politician is a good word, as well as, as cabinet minister. I also spent five years in the prime minister's office in Parliament Hill for Prime Minister Kretzian. So I, I, I bring my observations about the role of ordinary Catholics uh, from their role as voters and citizens, as activists, and as folks that put their name on the ballot, as, as I did. And in addressing it, I just wanted to make five short points. The first is that the Catholic faith calls us to get involved in politics, to get our hands dirty, to use Pope Francis's famous term. We don't have a choice. We simply can't leave politics to other people. 
The second point is that when we engage in politics, demanding action around issues related to sustainable development, such as climate change, it's not optional. As Catholics, uh, these issues have to be part of our personal political agenda. It has to factor into how we vote, how we try to influence our elected representatives and the issues that we may take on as elected uh, officials or candidates for election. Which brings me to my third point, addressing issues uh, tied to sustainable development in the political arena is about action, not simply saying the right things. Although it may be different in other jurisdictions, I would argue that here in Canada, most politicians will tell you that they are concerned about climate change. They're also against poverty. They're in favor of equality for all. Most of, us will, most of them will also tell you that they're opposed to crime and they think traffic gridlock is a bad thing. The real question is the extent to which they're gonna to try to make fight issues like fighting climate change a real priority. It doesn't matter who's in power. Governments have limited resources, time, and political capital. Truly being in favor of addressing issues tied to sustainable development means devoting those scarce resources to addressing those challenges, even if it means pushing other priorities further down the list, which can create their own set of political problems. And it won't be easy achieving this. Bringing about climate justice and the broader sustainable development agenda involves tough choices which brings me to my fourth point. Catholics can't simply call for action and then run for cover when it means that taxes have to increase, parts of our economy may have to wind down or demands are placed upon us by government to change our lifestyles. I can tell you from experience that the loneliest person on earth is a politician trying to do the right thing. And the only way that they are going to succeed is if the public backs them. The Catholic laity needs to gain an appreciation of its collective power. If every Catholic in Canada, for example, told every candidate that knocked at their door that issues tied to climate justice were important to them, that it would influence how they voted, and that they were sincerely willing to support a government that called upon citizens to make some sacrifices to see it done, it would bring about a sea change. Yet it doesn't happen. Having knocked on thousands of doors as a politician, I was always shocked at how rarely the environment came up or poverty and care for the most vulnerable for that matter. Which takes me to my final point. The Catholic call to engage in politics is a call to meet society where it is and to recognize that there are no perfect solutions in our broken world. This can't be an exercise in finding those voices that scream the loudest, telling us that there's a crisis going on and we need action now with little in the way of practical, workable solutions to back up their rhetoric. There's ab absolutely nothing simple about addressing these issues. Take the climate crisis. Here in Canada, the Canadian economy has a huge dependency on oil and gas. We are a gigantic country with, very in with a very incomplete system of transportation infrastructure. And we have a population that's dealing with a lot right now and not anxious for more sacrifices. Making progress is going to require lots of half measures, compromises, and situations of two steps forward and one back. We also have to acknowledge that nobody has all the answers. Part of the Catholic call is to set aside our self-righteousness, listen to different perspectives, and be open to dialogue. That said, meeting the world where it is doesn't mean downplaying the seriousness of the issues facing our society. Just an acknowledgement but it's gonna take lots of work and it's very complex. As Laudato Si reminds us, the climate crisis and other issues tied to sustainable development are political issues. We can't leave them to the market to sort out. As Catholics, we have a duty and a responsibility to get involved in a real and meaningful way through our political system. Thanks very much, John, uh, for that opening. Uh... Oh, great opening remarks. Uh, I mean, we've been reflecting on the role of the church leadership, but you really uh, took us to the level of the laity and that collective power that you mentioned um, is, is incredibly important and often not used to its full potential. Um, Jenny Cafiso, uh, would you like, uh, we'll turn it over to you now for a few remarks about the role of the laity. What, what is specifically the role of the laity in promote, promoting uh, integral human development? Thanks, John. Um, 
And thanks for the opportunity to the organizers for uh, to share these thoughts and to be with this group. Um, I'm happy to be part of it. And to I want to just share some thoughts based on my own experience as a laywoman who has worked in uh, promoting sustainable development <laughs> throughout my life, uh, alongside um, a lot of thousands of lay people who have dedicated their lives to justice and peace, uh, and with whom I've had the great privilege of working. So I, I wanted to do this just by sharing a couple of very concrete examples of uh, uh, people and, uh, and organizations that I know, which for me illustrate the role of the laity um, in living out with uh, Cardinal Cherney was referring as uh, being siblings and uh, practicing fraternity and, and, and working as if we were uh, uh, all human beings with the same rights and, and dignity. Uh, first of all, I want to mention Gerardo. He's a, he's a young journalist in the Jesuit-run uh, Radio Progreso in Honduras, uh, which is headed by Jesuit priest Ismael Moreno. And uh, the mission of Radio Progreso is uh, to uh, stand in defense of people's rights, to denounce impunity in a country where violence and corruption and drug trade are rampant, and to stand in solidarity with land defenders who are systematically forced, uh, forcibly displaced from their land and killed due to mining and hydroelectric pro uh, development projects. So in other words, due to non-sustainable development and the misappropriation of the common good as uh, that Cardinal Cherney was, was talking about today, um, it's rooted in the, their work and their mission is rooted in the belief that the goods of the earth are a common good. Um, so Radio Progresso tries to amplify the voice of poor and marginalized people, and for this, some of their staff and partners have been persecuted and killed. And I want to mention particularly Berta Cáceres, who was a renowned environmental activist and indigenous leader who was murdered in 2016 uh, for fighting uh, for sustainable development and against um, resource extraction. And there have been others since then. And so when I met Gerardo, who is in his 30s and the father of three young children who were running around while we were speaking, um, he told me of the death threats that he receives uh, for his work and how, as a result, he changes location where he sleeps uh, every couple of days in order to keep safe. And I asked him, why does he continue and why does he not leave the country as so many in Honduras have? been forced to do. And he said, in his own words, he said, because we need to be light in the darkness. Those are his words. And so he has obviously uh, recognized the we that Cardinal Cherney was speaking about today. Uh, he sees himself as a sibling to his uh, fellow um, brothers and sisters in Honduras, and he understands uh, the importance of universal solidarity. And I mention him because um, I feel that's what in some ways uh, illustrates the role uh, that he understood what the role of the laity in uh, integral human development is. Uh, he understands that all of us, whether we're lay people or religious, we are called to be light in the darkness and to work uh, for a type of development that is sustainable, that is based on free, prior, informed consent from the local population that respects life and allows people to live in dignity. And, uh, and so he personally lives that principle of solidarity uh, that we spoke about this morning and sees the land uh, and resources within it, not as a private property, but as a common good. Um, and they pay, uh, he and others pay with their lives for assuming this role. And it's a sacrifice that uh, for lay people has far reaching impact on their families, their children and their communities. Uh, and it is generational uh, because they live, they really serve as models of holiness in, uh, in my, uh, as I see it. Uh, the second example I want to give is an, of, a, of an organization I worked for uh, for eight years in Rome that John referred to um, and that we now support from Canadian Jesuits International. Uh, the Jesuit Refugee Service was founded by Pedro, Father Pedro Arupe, who was then the Superior General of the Jesuits um, in 1980 as a response to the crisis of the so-called boat people. 
And uh, Father Aruba was moved by the plight of refugees uh, who we consider to be the last of the earth, not only because they were poor, but because they were stripped of all their rights. And he called on the Society of Jesus to be a service to the refugees. And he had a number of important insights when he founded the organization, but I want to mention two. First was that uh, this was to be a service that would transform the society of Jesus through the lives and, and experience of the refugees. In other words, that service would make the society of Jesus better. And the second insight was that the service was not only a call to Jesuits. He, it was a call, it was to be from the very beginning, a collaborative effort with other religious congregations and with the laity. And today, JRS, uh, which articulates his mission as to accompany, serve, and advocate, is present in 57 countries, uh, serves over a million people, including the refugees that are pouring now from Ukraine. And by the end of 2021, the total number of people working with JRS and the various projects, including teachers and refugee camps and others, were over 8,871. There are almost 9,000 people. And of those, only 41 were Jesuits. So when you think about that, that's an incredible statistic because the JRS is an apostolate of the Society of Jesus um, and with headquarters in Rome, but the call of Father Ruba was a call to all of us. And today, JRS cannot exist without the dedication, vision, and commitment and sacrifice of lay people, many of whom are women, uh, who work alongside Jesuits. And so I could give a lot of other examples, but I just wanted to, you know, I could give examples from the Amazon, Zambia, South Sudan, from Ch uh, Chappas, um, and maybe there'll be time a bit later to do that. But I just wanted to, to mention these uh, as uh, examples that tell us not only how Catholics can affect the world affairs uh, through its capillary presence in uh, um, uh, at the local level through uh, negotiations, advocacy, conflict resolution, but and they can really affect integral and sustainable human development. And, and I, just, I think that it's only as when we as lay people do that, that uh, we're fulfilling our true location. Thanks, thanks, Jenny. Thanks for highlight. I, I love how you highlight the role of lay people, including lay women. And uh, I remember you telling about the experience of uh, lay women gathering with uh, Father General in Rome of the Jesuits and, and acknowledging that contribution um, and the legacy of, of Arupe. Um, I also liked your example of Latin America, uh, and uh, maybe that's a good segue for Joe Gunn, who's got extensive knowledge of the role of laity in Latin America, as well as in Canada, uh, to compare and contrast. But uh, Joe, how do you see things now in terms of the role of the laity in 2022 with regard to integral human development. Well, peace be with you and everyone that's on this, on this particular event, this call. I'm speaking to you from the uh, unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin people. Uh, I work now with the Oblates, so uh, we, this is a religious congregation that ran 48 uh, residential schools. And uh, so that's very much on my mind and I'll talk about that in a moment. But in answer to the question, uh, Father John, about the role of the laity, they're really, to simplify overly, there are two things we need to do. One is to understand the faith and the other is to perhaps as Jenny said, be the light in the darkness, let's live the faith. So what we found from this morning's uh, wonderful, wonderful panel and the presentation from Cardinal Michael was, you know, that we don't, in our tradition, we don't lack teaching. We have the gospels, we have Catholic social thought. Uh, many of us may not know that the Catholic bishops of Canada actually released three pastoral letters on the question of ecological conversion before the Si in 2015. Uh, I don't know how many of you might ask yourself the question, have I ever been in the pew and heard a sermon about those pastoral letters or the message that was part of it? I mean, the first pastoral letter in 2003 of the Catholic bishops on this uh, topic uh, 
it was actually noticed, and I presume it was by our keynote speaker this morning, uh, who had a lot to do with Laudato Si, because it's quoted in Laudato Si number 85. And so uh, I'm not sure that us, too many of our congregants or participants have noticed those kinds of things. But we have the teaching. Now, what I wanted to do in the remarks that I make about that is how we live into it is to suggest that in North America, as we have learned from our experience in Latin America, people like Jenny and I that live there, is that we have to be involved in living the faith by being involved in movements. You don't do this on your own. And so I want to make a call out to uh, Development and Peace, which Peter can talk about. And Jenny worked at Development and Peace uh, for some years. Uh, the aid agency of the Catholic Church in Canada and its campaigns. Uh, do we know that there is a Laudato Si movement worldwide? And that for the last two years, there's actually three years, I guess, there's been a Laudato Si movement in Canada. They've just produced the Catholic Eco Investment Accelerator Toolkit. And that allows for institutions, uh, Catholic colleges, uh, perhaps uh, you're part of one, uh, to actually uh, divest and then reinvest in Indigenous organizations and in sustainable development projects and so on and so on. Uh, that group has been working for a couple of years. Uh, ecumenical, we have, uh, we have ecumenical movements in Canada through Kairos. Uh, two years ago, we created a coalition called For the Love of Creation. Uh, which has advocacy and uh, education programs. We have uh, Citizens for Public Justice as part of that. They have a Lenten program, Give It Up for the Earth, where people can commit to doing uh, Lent in an ecologically sustainable way, but also uh, advocating with the government. Uh, someone, I think it was Anne earlier on this morning, mentioned Église Verte in, uh, in Quebec, movements to take... Uh, ecological responsibility very, very seriously. In uh, English Canada, the joint ecological ministries, mostly run by, I would have to say again, religious women. Uh, there are a few of us that are blessed among women, but mostly the sisters are way ahead of the fellows on, on these uh, kinds of movements. And a joint ecological ministries has worked on a range of these issues. And just three months ago, uh, about a 15, a dozen religious congregations set up something called the Office of Religious Congregations for Integral Ecology. And we're working on these kinds of issues. Um, sisters, of course, are considered uh, lay people as well. So I wanted to include them. And finally, Severine mentioned this morning, there is something that you may or may not know about called the Laudato Si Action Platform that was launched on November 14th last year uh, by uh, Cardinal Cherneys de Castri. Uh, November 14th is the International Day, uh, inter or World Day for the Poor in the Catholic Church. And the idea is that you can sign up Catholic institutions, colleges, congregations like Jesuits and Oblates uh, and others can sign up and follow a seven year plan to live into Laudato Si and the whole uh, concept of, uh, of integral ecology. So, in summary, what the role of the laity is, in Canada especially, is to join and get actively involved in any one or several of these really important movements. Thank you. Joe, thank you very much. That's very helpful and uh, that you actually are naming the movements because I'm sure many people on this call might be wondering, what can I do as an individual? Uh, but as you say, it's, it's by banding together to really affect change as a group, as a movement. And uh, Maybe some of these movements are not as familiar to some of the people on this call. So uh, thank you for sharing that. Um, Peter Baltudis, uh, over to you. Uh, you've got the academic insight, but also some of the uh, theological background. And you studied uh, development and peace and other movements. Um, how do you see the role of the la uh, laity in, on this issue of, of uh, integral human development? Great. First of all, it is really an honor and a privilege to be here with all of you this morning. So I'm very grateful to be here and hopefully share a few modest insights. Uh, I come to you today from uh, St. Mary's University, which is located in the traditional territories of the Blackfoot and the people of Treaty 7. 
Um, these are the Sikseka, the Pukainai, the Kainai, the Sutina, and the Stony Nakota peoples. Uh, we're situated in an area once known as Mokinsis, today known as the city of Calgary, which is also home of the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. So, as was mentioned earlier, um, my doctoral dissertation, as well as my research since, is focused on this organization known as Development and Peace. So, being a historian, similar to Massimo, who spoke earlier, I think I want to situate my comments as a historian, trying to address the question, what is the role of the laity in promoting global sustainable development? And I want to take you back to a really unique moment in the history of um, religion in Canada. And that is the moment just at the end of the Second Vatican Council. So in 1965, approximately 80 or so Canadian bishops who were a part of the council um, came back from the council with this burning question, what do we do now? Most of the bishops, they wrote in their journals, they wrote back to their diocese. I've had a chance to read some of their memoirs. They speak about being profoundly transformed by the experience of Vatican II. And at Vatican II, the thing they always speak about is, yes, it's the number of participants, but even more so is the diversity of participants. Um, I like the term that Massimo used earlier, this idea of NATO Catholicism. So if you look at the European bishops and North American bishops, they comprise roughly 48% of the Council Fathers at Vatican II. That means that just over half come from the Global South. And the Canadian bishops, every single one of them, speak about the profound insights and how much they learned at the Second Vatican Council. So they came back to Canada saying, we need to do something. And their answer was creating this organization that was called the Canadian Catholic Organization for Development and Peace. Now that was officially launched in 1967. So it took them roughly about a year and a half to figure out how to make this concrete. So in preparation for my remarks today, I was reading through the original proposal the bishops put together for this new organization. And this document is profoundly prophetic. Here's why. In this document, they say first and foremost, the church, especially in Canada, needs to hear the cry of the poor. They need to address the concerns uh, that were spoken about in Gaudium et Spes, the pastoral constitution of the church in the modern world. They realize the church can no longer ignore what's happening. This is not a footnote to theology. This needs to be a central part of the workings of the Catholic Church, not just in Canada, but in response to what's happening internationally. But number two, in the founding document, they specifically cite the document Lumen Gentium, the dogmatic constitution on the church in the modern world. Uh, I'm sorry, the dogmatic constitution on the church. And I want to quote for you uh, a key part of this document. When they create this new organization, they call it, quote, an opportunity for hierarchy, laity cooperation. The entire organization, which they're proposing, which is now known as Development and Peace, should be established as a, and this is bold and underlined, bishops, clergy, lay association, reflecting thereby the new conception, post-council, of the church as defined in Lumen Gentium. It requires, therefore, that participation of the laity be substantial within this new organization in the church. So what's interesting here is the bishops realize this cannot be a top-down organization. It needs to involve the totality of the church. And so ultimately what they do is they set up a board of governors that's comprised of 21 individuals, only two of which are bishops, but the other 19 are lay people because the bishops realized they needed the expertise and insights of the laity. What's fascinating about development and peace is that only are they trying to promote a new ecclesiological model of being church doing this work of development, but also as you read through the document, they also call upon this movement as being, quote, a new opportunity for ecumenism. So they see this as being not just the purview of the Catholic church proper, but as uh, Joe Gunn was very uh, adept at pointing out, it's the church working in partnership and collaboration, not just with bishops, clergy, and laity, but also the Catholic church with other Christian groups, but also other non-Christian groups, and trying to do this work of justice, as Joe points out, the work being done together. I know my time is almost up, but I think in many ways, as Joe is mentioning, we have the theology, we have the vision. The question is, do we have the courage to actually implement it? And I'll stop there for now. 
Thanks. Thanks very much, Peter, for giving us that context. I mean, we need to the Vatican II context, but also the ecumenical interfaith uh, elements too. Um, you know, when I was listening to Cardinal Cherney this morning, uh, I was thinking about the interfaith context and uh, uh, a lot of what he was saying about fraternity. Uh, I mean, we see it in other faith traditions. Um, you know, here I am speaking to you from Toronto, which is home to many Indigenous uh, peoples, Huron Wendat, Haudenosaunee, Mississauga of the Credit. But one of the early uh, agreements there was the dish with one spoon. And the whole idea behind that is there's, uh, there's a dish with enough food for everybody and there's one spoon. You take what you need and you put the spoon back so that others can take what they need. There is enough for all, in other words. And so that, that's interesting uh, from Indigenous perspectives. There's, there seems to be a great compatibility there that... Uh, that we're not talking about private property here so much as, as um, the stewardship over common good. But that yes, brings me to the first question here. Uh, I, I won't uh, go in order. You just feel free to uh, respond uh, in, in two or three minutes to the question. Um, and that is, you know, as Catholics, we're rooted in Catholic social teaching and which is often called the best kept secret in the church. Uh, a lot of Catholics don't know it. But what what do you uh, what does Catholic social teaching have to tell us about the responsibility of ordinary Catholics for the world beyond our national borders, and and do you see a truly global fraternal fraternity agenda developing within the church? Um, what, what how do you see the, the the impact of Catholic social teaching, which probably should be better known than it is, um, in in bringing about this fraternity agenda in the church? Um, just feel the response. I won't go on any. I won't call on you, but you know who you are, so uh, feel free to jump in. I can jump in just to get the ball rolling. Um, the reality is, is that the Catholic Church has a tremendously rich theology around this notion of not working only locally but internationally. Um, John the Twenty Third, in his document in 1961, Matre Magistra really is the first papal encyclical that talks about the inequality between nations. Um, then, of course, the mentioned Vatican II and Gadi Metzpez begins talking about the scandal where some nations are wealthy and others are quite poor. It was Pope Paul VI uh, was the first pope really to travel internationally. who saw firsthand a lot of the poverty uh, across the global south. And that's when 1967, he releases the really important document, Populorum Progressio. And very famously, the end of that document, his final section is called Development is the New Name for Peace. Kind of making this transition to say, if we want peace, we have to get to some of the root underlying causes of warfare. So doing this work of development. Um, of course, John Paul II, um, in Solicitudo Rei Socialis, also picks this up. Benedict XVI picks it up, and of course, Pope Francis. So these are not new themes. They're there. Um, I think, that, once again, the challenge that uh, Joe gave to us um, is a lot of these sadly become dead letters. Beautiful theology, um, but how often does this actually trickle down into the pew? Uh, is my very wise doctoral dissertation director would often say, uh, what's the view from the pew? How much of this information is actually going to the view or the ears or the theology or spirituality of everyday average Catholics? And sadly, most of it has not trickled down. So yes, the theology is there. It's been well articulated, affirmed by numerous popes, um, but sadly, the message has not fully been received. And I think the answer to that, I think that Joe and Jenny and John have all hinted at this, is we need to find more creative ways of A, not only bringing this theology to the people, but I think the best way that's done is through the living model of witnesses who do this work and do this work profoundly effectively. And in many times, I know in my own classroom, I teach Catholic social teaching. When I start reading these documents, a lot of the students' eyes glaze over. When we start talking about the lived application, individuals, in many ways, prominent Canadian Catholics and Catholic social activists, that's when they start understanding the concrete implications of these teachings. So I think we have this rich theology, but where we struggle is how to actually take that theology and put it into pastoral practice. Thanks, Peter. And I know I know at St. Mary's you have learning opportunities where students can actually get their hands dirty getting involved. And that's maybe what people need to, to get it down from the abstract level to, to concrete uh, examples. Anybody else on that, Catholics? Jenny? 
Oh, Jenny, you're on mute. Uh, sorry. And uh, these these are the most famous words in the last <laughs> two years. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you're on mute. Um, yeah, I. Um, yeah, so like Catholic social teachings talk about you know the right to dignify work, the right of workers, of solidarity, of justice, of uh, the care of God's creation. And, and it's, you know, it's based obviously on the gospel and the attitudes as Jesus speaking to people on the margins, the women at the well, to sinners, widows, and others. And it it is provide it does provide the root and uh, inspiration for uh, integral human development for um, a just society, and if we are wanting to, if we do want to um, uh, live by them, in today's world we cannot but be global. Uh, it you know just to give an example it was mentioned i think this morning uh that you know for example the increase in uh in uh, uh resources for the use in green technology such as batteries it has great impact in countries of the global south in the um the democratic republic of congo and um, mining companies from the global north uh, some of which are canadian operate with utter impunity and the impact on our artisanal mining by uh, by perpetuating the system where basically women and children are used like slaves for cleaning and processing minerals uh, such as cobalt and uh, it is having a huge impact on their lives and their health and the communities and the environment. Uh, so, you know, we can't buy a green electric car without thinking of that. So um, if, if we are, if we do want to um, uh, apply Catholic social teachings, we cannot do that in isolation. It's not a private conversion, it's a, a global action. And I think uh, I, you know, I agree with John, I was going to say the same, that Catholic social teaching is, they, it's often referred as the best kept secret. Um, but there are, there certainly are many opportunities now for us to act. I just mentioned one, but there's been another one, uh, you know, in the second, is, uh, recent years, a call to Catholic institutions to divest from fossil fuels. And it has been called uh, physical, moral, and theological imperative. Uh, and uh, as a response to uh, the Pope's uh, love that we'll see. And, you know, it's a, it's a physical imperative because we know the science and the evidence about climate change. And it's a moral imperative because we know the impact that the climate crisis is having on the most vulnerable people in the world, including what I just mentioned, uh, people who are digging cobalt. And it's a theological imperative because we've been entrusted with the care of creation. And so, um, I think we have to acknowledge that there are a number of Catholic institutions that have uh, publicly committed and taken some very concrete action to divest okay, and uh, to continue avoiding investment in fossil fuel sector. But there's still a lot more to do. And I think that's where, um, you know, lay people have to play a very significant role uh, in ensuring that this happens. A and to the other thing is to be involved in the whole campaign for mandatory uh, due diligence uh, governing the private sector to uh, ensure that uh, human rights are respected by our businesses where a lot of lay people are working. And so, and I would actually invite people to a webinar tomorrow uh, that you uh, on this particular issue of the mandatory human rights due diligence. Uh, you can find it on our website. So there's a lot to be done and a lot that is being done. Thanks, Jenny. Thanks for reminding us of the global context, which is so crucial. John, uh, Joe, uh, the best kept secret in the church. How do we uh, get it out of the uh, get it out of the cellar <laughs> and 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 uh, move it to a place where uh, it really advances this global fraternity agenda. Who wants to go first? Joe, Joe, you and I both turned our, our microphones on at the same time. You go. Age All right. Beauty. I'll, be, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try to be brief, which if you see Joe burst out laughing, yeah, he did with the, he knows me too well. Liz, I agree with that. everything everyone said. Um, I guess, I guess the, the, the point that I would make just to add to the conversation is um, 
the, the laity are busy people. They are overwhelmed by information. They are scared people. They are paying $1.80 a, a liter for gas. They're going to the grocery store and, and, and practically fainting when they get their bill. Um, they're terrified of, of what's happening. Everyone they know has COVID or they have COVID. I mean, this is, this is a really, really overwhelming time. And where I see Catholic social teaching playing such a key role is it's so disruptive because this overwhelming time, and I'm not blaming anyone. Hey, I, you know, I'm, I'm guilty as charged. It causes you to turn inwards. Um, it's about me. It's about my family. Uh, maybe it's about my community. Um, it's, it's, it's about all these, these personal things. And Catholic social teaching doesn't say you don't have to be worried about those. But it has one, you know, as we heard so, so eloquently from, from, from Cardinal Cherney this morning, that one key element is that I have a responsibility for everyone uh, throughout the world. Um, you know, I was, I was, and maybe fascinated is the wrong word. I, I, I don't mean it in a, in, a, in, a, in a disinterested way, but watching what happened over vaccines, um, you know, no one said, wait a minute, Canada has, is a rich country which has a good healthcare system. There are parts of this world where there is very little in terms of, of the healthcare infrastructure. Maybe they should be getting vaccines first. I mean, I, I had a, a private conversation with a, a political friend of mine. Um, and he didn't, I don't mean this in any way, he wasn't being, being mean or anything, he just burst out laughing. He said, could you imagine making that argument publicly? Uh, you know, it's about us, it's about me, it's about, it's, you know, in, in this world, it's even more about me. And that's where I, I see that value, because it's a message to Catholics to say, folks, if you want to continue being true to your faith, you, you have to think about everyone in the world as, as, you know, as your, as, your, as your brother and sister. And that is such a powerful message and the implications. And I think just to maybe jolt us a bit out of this incredibly bizarre world that we're living in uh, right now, uh, it has a, a tremendous value. And that, that point of solidarity alone. Thanks, John. Wow. Well, John, that's, thanks for that, that context. I think it's really, really important. But I, I'd like to say, you know what? The human fraternity agenda in Canada right now is at a turning point in the Catholic Church. We have to set priorities. And the priority, I would say, for Catholics and probably all people of faith, but especially Catholics in Canada right now, it has to pass through the painful truth and difficulty of reconciliation and decolonization. And I think we have to, there's no way we can not address that if we want to be a church of integral ecology. So Laudato Si, like, as everybody's mentioned, we have the teaching. And Laudato Si, the Pope calls us in, in paragraph 146 to recognize that Indigenous people aren't, they aren't, you know, some group we have to be in touch with. Or, you know, we're doing this synod process in many parishes right now where people are, no, no, no. According to Laudato Si, Indigenous people are the principal dialogue partners. Now, what would that mean for our church today? Is it possible to be a synodal church in Canada today? Is it possible to do reconciliation without addressing this? Uh, we're lucky that Indigenous worldviews are validated in, in uh, Laudato Si. And we, what we know in, for example, research by a group called the Indigenous Environmental Network has pointed out that because of the Indigenous resistance that we've seen in, in Canada and the United States to the large uh, infrastructure projects for energy projects and pipelines and so on, that Indigenous resistance has actually delayed greenhouse gas pollution that is the equivalent of about a quarter of our annual emissions in Canada and the United States. So if we're talking about the environmental agenda, if we're talking about the reconciliation agenda, we have to have movements in the church that are up to uh, real adult relationships with indigenous people and activists that are doing that kind of work. And let me just finally say, we have a long way to go on this. Last night uh, in my parish, we were involved in a, uh, we have an eight week program around reconciliation. There was an Indigenous priest speaking to us, a Canadian uh, a priest from 
up around the Jesuit area there, Father John, up from Wiki, uh, Manitoulin Island and so on, mentioned that he was invited to go and celebrate an indigenous mass, if you will, in an Ottawa parish. He was ready to go. And in his expression of this, he would smudge beforehand. And a group of people in that parish uh, let the pastor know that if this priest showed up and smudged the congregation at the beginning of this, they would stand up, hold up signs saying that this was heretical and uh, use the word pagan and so on. And they would uh, stop the service or leave, walk out. You know, we, as a church, we experienced this in the Synod on the Amazon when the Pachamama symbols were were thrown into the Tiber River and so on. And I think Massimo pointed out some of the culture wars that we've got in the United States. We have a long way to go in Canada too. And I think this uh, this agenda, I wanted to just put it forward. It's it's I think it's a real priority for all of us. Joe, I'm glad you raised the issue of Indigenous um, peoples. And I know that's one of the questions in the Q&A. And uh, we'll get back to it in a second because uh, it's been asked. And also I'd invite, uh, invite um, the audience to put your questions in the Q&A uh, and we will get to them. We have till 1.45. Um, we will come back to the, the Indigenous question because it, it is definitely relevant. I was quite struck, Joe, by what you said that we need to decolonize. We need to, the church uh, has a legacy here. Um, I know uh, here in Toronto, uh, uh, I've, been, I've been fortunate to be part of some local initiatives where parishes are saying, you know, with the discovery of unmarked graves, what has been our role? And uh, where they're using the uh, Jesuit Forum Guide, listening to Indigenous voices and other resources to have sharing circles. So there's what's happening at the top levels of our church with the Pope's uh, uh, upcoming visit. But it's also interesting to see what's happening at, at the level of the grassroots and the laity. Um, so please uh, put your questions in the Q&A. Um, Joe, you also mentioned um, culture wars. <laughs> uh, you know, if the church is going to act, uh, the laity, how do ordinary lay Catholics do this in a world that's becoming increasingly divided, polarized, and not just the world, but I mean, we could even look within our own church um, with the divisions in the church. If we're going to implement this vision that is outlined so beautifully in Laudato Si and Fratelli Tutti and Carida Amazonia, um, I know my colleague, John, um, Father John McCarthy, is trying to adapt this to the boreal context, right? Um, how do we deal with the, the, the divisions we see in our world and our church uh, if we're going to uh, care for our common home? And again, I, I invite each panelist to offer you know, a brief two to three minute reflection on that. Is that a challenge? Uh, how do we overcome that challenge if we're going to speak with a united voice on these issues and act? Yeah, John. Sorry, I'll uh, I'll go first. Um, I think it's a huge challenge. Um, I think that uh, uh, you know certain branches of the church, their focus on on abortion, a few other hot button issues, is 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 robbing us of of a, of a larger voice. Not because they're not important issues, but they've they've stopped being linked to public policy. They've become ways to keep score. Uh, instead of talking about uh, a, an overall Catholic respect for life at all stages and all that it ties into the issues that we've been talking today around the environment and development and peace and that sort of thing, it, it, it becomes a discussion of whether, uh, uh, you know, Joe Biden should, should be given communion. And there are voices in Canada, uh, not as loud, saying should Justin Trudeau be given communion? Um, you know, I think the first role for every Catholic, and repeating what I said in my remarks, is you have to meet the world where it is. Uh, you have to understand the complexities of the world. We live in a pluralistic society. You have to start to connect some of these messages together. And as I said, if you want to uh, talk about uh, a respect for life, well, you've got to bring in poverty. You've got to bring in development. You've got to bring in uh, the environment. You've got to bring in Indigenous reconciliation. And I think that, that when Catholics can stop using certain issues as a way of simply keeping score uh, and actually talk about practical ways that we can change public policy and that we can connect the, the Catholic message to what's really happening out there, I think the better. But, uh, you know, the, it, I become very disheartened, uh, you know, when you hear certain commentators where it's just, it's just, sorry, I keep saying it, but it's, it's about keeping score. It's about labeling. 
Malloy's a dissident Catholic. Uh, you know, I'm going to I'm going to write a letter to his priest. I don't like him as a politician because he claims to be a Catholic. I don't know how that furthers a uh, uh, public policy agenda. So, you know, meet the world where it is. Thanks, John. Yeah, uh, Jenny. And, and, yeah. Yeah, just uh, I guess a couple of thoughts. Uh, just uh, in uh, adding to uh, what John said and others. Um, uh, I mean, I, you know, I, I think I feel that we as lay Catholics have to exercise our freedom uh, and uh, and and be speak out and be active and uh, contribute to finding answers. And there are some principles, I guess, that I would uh, point to. And, um, you know, uh, when uh, John Joe was talking about uh, uh, the example he gave and about indigenous people and how, I think uh, we have to, first of all, we have to realize that if we really wanna affect change, it's not gonna be easy. And we're going to be have to be willing to be challenged, and we have to be willing to have our power and privilege um, challenged. And so, when we say, you know, that we have to um, give voice to people on the margins, whether it's Indigenous people or people of color or other people who are marginalized because of uh, their their color, class, gender, or whatever. Um, it, while we know and we say that um, it is among those people who are on the margins where a new solution has found that we need to, uh, a solution can only be a solution if that has involved the voice of people on the margins. But do we realize that that does not mean only inviting them to be a speaker at one of our events or um, writing, yeah, um, have you know an article for one of our newsletters? And it, you know, are we really willing to make the kind of structural changes so that they really are at the table? I mean, we have to look at things like, um, yeah, who gets invited to our panels? Who sits on our boards uh, of governance? Who who is hired among our staff? Who has an, uh, access to? courses and workshops and travel that we have access to. And, you know, it's only when their voice is at the table that uh, they that the change will happen. You know, uh, not too long ago, I was asking someone, uh, a, a woman of color, uh, if she could suggest some people um, to be on my board. And her response was, you know, we're kind of tired as black people to be asked to be on boards to, to uh, so that you have representation. Or do you have an anti-oppression policy? You know, how are you implementing that? And it's jolting, but it's absolutely right. And uh, and that's what we have to be prepared to do. Uh, and the the other thing I'll say is that um, we really have to rethink. Uh, how we understand rights and privileges. You know, uh, a donor uh, not some time ago said to me that he wanted his donation to go to real needs and not to education because he considered that to be a luxury. And I, you know, and yet in Canada, for us, education is a, is a human right. And, you know, there's a paradox here, you know, that those of us who are privileged consider our privilege to be our right. But for the poor, we consider what should be their basic human right to be a privilege. And, um, and that keeps happening. And uh, we, we really have to uh, rethink um, this, you know, and it's based on this relationship of a difference of power. But uh, we have to rethink who we think has a right and, who ha and, and what rights are, in fact, privileges. That's interesting, Jenny, because I mean, the question was about polarization division. And what I hear you saying is kind of similar to, to what Pope Francis has been saying. It's like, let's bring the voices on the margins kind of in the center uh, of the church and, and give them proper place. And uh, I know from my time in Regina working with the indigenous, they often repeated that phrase, nothing about us without us, uh, to be truly at the table and just, uh, yeah, you know, form of tokenism or, or what have you. Um, Joe, uh, Peter, any thoughts on that or the, how to act as a common witness in a world of division? Um, I, I wish I had the answer to this question because if I did, we could solve so many problems. Um, 
But my own insights are that uh, Cardinal Trudy mentioned this in his keynote address, uh, or perhaps it was in his Q&A session afterwards. We can't underestimate the value of dialogue. I think part of the problem is we've lost the art of civil discourse. And especially as we get sort of polarized into political factions or ideological factions, even these different church factions, um, I'm sure many of us here are painfully aware of how toxic Catholic social media can be. Um, the term heretic is used very casually. Um, and I often wonder if I wasn't a Catholic, why would I want to be a part of this self-cannibalizing tribe that seems so hateful? Um, but the reality is, I think, is that A, we can't give up on people. And I think when we start demonizing the other, that's problematic. So I think it's important we always have dialogue. And I come to you today, as I said, from the province of Alberta. Um, I regularly, uh, when I attend mass and see in the church parking lot, um, lots of F trio stickers in the back of trucks. Um, I'm thinking, wow, these are people that are coming in to mass. They have their concerns, they have their opinions. But I think what's important is that we actually listen to them. I was invited to speak about Laudato Si uh, at a CWL convention that was happening in Calgary. And it's tricky because sometimes the language that one uses can immediately turn people on or turn people off. Small case in point. If we talk about the extraction of bitumen from Northern Alberta, if you call it the oil sands, that means implicitly you like what's happening there. If you call it the tar sands, that means you don't like what's happening there. So you have to be very careful how you situate or even call it these things, because right away, you're going to turn some people off from the conversation. So I think our challenge as Catholics, in many ways, is to do what Pope Francis is calling upon us to do, and that's finding some kind of common language, a way to say, okay, so for example, when I was speaking about La Dao Tao Si, I said in my, my remarks, I said, I don't want to today talk about climate change. Instead, let's just look at our air quality. What's happening to our air quality? Let's talk about our water quality. Let's talk about the earth and soil itself. And objectively, by any metric, we're failing miserably in all those categories. We can all agree that we have less of a healthy environment and our environment is being slowly destroyed. So it's trying to find a language that people can understand. And I would say afterwards, I was tremendously impressed at how many people who work in the oil and gas industry, uh, here we often call them roughnecks, those that work out on the rigs and those working up in Fort McMurray, they're just as concerned about what's happening to the environment as us academics in our ivory towers. And so I think sometimes it's actually listening to people, talking to people, and you start finding some commonalities. And that's where you start building. Um, it's not easy, it's painful and frustrating, but I think we can't give up on people. Thanks, Peter. That's really insightful. Uh, thanks. I appreciate that. Uh, Joel, would you have a... Yeah, I, I agree. And Jenny's, uh, Jenny's points too. I'm still reeling from some of those. Uh, John Malloy and I have a, have a Lutheran pal who throws out this kind of question to the to the church quite often and he asks us do you do you, do you want to be in the church as uh, part of the group of museum create, uh, curators or do you want to be part of a church where you play the role with others as adventure guides and i think that that brings the conversation alive i think from my experience in our church, the conversation around Catholic social thought, the dialogue that can take place because there are different points of views, allows us to, you know, actually be some of those adventure guides. And we might be richer in the conversation to go through that together. Um, I think also the, the meeting, the, the, the moment we're at in the church in Canada right now is kind of expressed by last Sunday's uh, gospel reading, you know. Uh, we're all supposed to believe in the risen Christ, but the kind of the reflection in our parish at the time in an oblate parish was, uh, yes, he is risen, but he's still got the wounds. You can still see those wounds. And part of our role is to uh, see ourselves in a different way. We don't have the answers, perhaps. We're wounded as well. 
uh, we have wounded others and that we have to uh, play a different role. Uh, Jenny's comments about understanding our own privilege and power and stepping back from that. We know that Jesus didn't fear the, the bloody and the broken. And we have this amazing Pope who calls us to be a field hospital. Uh, the, the frame of the church is a field hospital. We have to, we have to learn and to live into that. And perhaps lay people have to do that too. So I'd, I'd ask us to do two things in that. The challenge to myself really is we need to permeate this Canadian church with the frame of integral ecology and have that conversation as mm -hmm. legitimate way of being church. And what does that mean? And let's have those conversations which are not going to be easy. But secondly, I think Catholics don't demand enough of our institution. You know, the, somebody raised earlier, do we see the church as the people of God or the institution? It's actually legitimate for Catholics to be change promoters, not just in society, but also in the church. Could we really have a synodal church, a synodal, which Francis wants it to be a permanent synodality, a permanent aspect of what it is to be uh, a member of the, our faith community? Can we do that with the structures as they are right now? Can we, can we move to something new? Can we part of, be part of this journey of the, of the adventure guides? I think uh, being living into that uh, is the is the challenge we have before us and lay people. I hope there's space for all of us and not disappointments for all of us in taking that up. Thank, thanks, Joe. And uh, your comments about being an adventure guide. I see we've, it's stimulated a lot of uh, uh, interest here. Um, uh, a lot of questions coming in on the Q&A uh, related to our Canadian context and the culture and uh, just, uh, let's see now, a couple of people are recommending with regard to social media, and Peter, you talked about how this is, in many ways, hasn't been helpful in terms of reinforcing divisions, um, but there is a civil conversation going on in the U.S. in Cincinnati called BraverAngels.org. Um, they're developing a Catholic version of some of their workshops, um, trying to incorporate some of Pope Francis' views on a better kind of politics, how to civilize the, our political discourse. You can also Google the um, U.S. Catholic Bishops uh, Conference on that as well. Uh, it's engaging great conversation with people of different views. Also, uh, in getting C Catholic social teaching out there, of course, as we know, um, somebody asks here, um, what about social media? Are there any organizations working to use social media in creative and attractive ways to inform and educate young people about Catholic so social teaching? Perhaps something for teachers to use, something like the Kairos blanket exercise. Um, uh, think of, uh, anybody want to just uh, quickly mention some uh, interesting ways that social media is being engaged on these issues to get Catholic social teaching out there to a broader audience, including a younger audience. Um, I'll just offer a few quick insights because as someone who teaches Catholic social justice to university students, I'm always trying to find multimedia <laughs> dynamic ways of presenting them. Two really great ones I found that have been very, uh, I think, successful in the classroom. Uh, one is um, CRS, Catholic Relief Services. They have a YouTube series called CST, Catholic Social Teaching. So it's CST 101. And basically it's seven videos. They're all about maybe two and a half minutes long. So oftentimes um, after we spend, you know, a better part of a lecture delving into these concepts like subsidiarity or the preferential option for the poor, we're trying to work our way through it. These videos are short, nice little kind of capstones to those conversations to tie things all together. So you can find those on YouTube, which are helpful. And then also on, I believe it's pronounced, is it Kafod? Um, oh, yeah. C-A-F-O-D mm -hmm. out of the UK. Um, they have a brilliant series of animated videos summarizing the papal encyclicals of Pope Francis. Wow. So they have like a four and a half minute one for the downtown C. They just did one for Fratelli Tutti. And I find they're extremely good at drawing key quotes at the document. They have engaging animation, um, and I find my students are always grateful to have a four and a half minute summary rather than sitting down and reading the length of this of these long documents. And I say this shouldn't substitute your reading of the documents, but they're good ways to help spark conversations and good ways to summarize some key ideas. 
So um, those are two initial suggestions I recommend to anyone because they're both excellent Great. series. Thanks, Peter. Very helpful. Anybody else on that one? Uh, social media? No? Okay. Yeah, uh, John. This is cheating. Uh, but can I make a comment about social media? I, I, it's, it's, it's a hobby horse, so I'll, I'll be very quick. Um, it is our lives. Um, my kids' lives are, are in, their, in their pockets or in an iPad. Um, there's lots of people out there who say they don't like what the Catholic, I think there's two things. They don't like what the Catholic Church is saying, but there's also lots of people out there saying, why is it relevant to our life? And where is um, leadership from the church about discussions about social media and the way it's taken over our world? And one of the most uh, refreshing things about Fratelli Tutti is, you know, the Pope talks all about it. Um, and yet that disconnect that Joe talks about uh, to the pew. I have, I have yet to hear uh, a, a sermon on social media, the good and the bad. Of course, it, it, it can have a wonderful uh, role to play in the church, but it, it, it's also playing a very, very complex role in our lives, which I think rightly so aspects of it are destructive. And yet there, there is something that, you know, we could be talking about as a church and the, and the, and the role that it's playing. So I'm cheating because that's not the question, but it's, in my mind is so is so crucial a discussion that we should have uh, tied into uh, uh, Catholic social teaching, tied into our responsibility, tied into dialogue, tied into all the issues we've brought up today. Thanks, John. I'm going to, uh, let's move well, on. To, oh, sorry. Throw one last thing out there, and this perhaps yeah. is the best suggestion of all, is um, some of you may or may not know that every month, Pope Francis puts out something called the Pope video, which is a one minute long video that talks about his monthly prayer intentions. Mm -hmm. And they're almost always geared around themes of Catholic social teaching. So I find for myself, I subscribe to it. So every month I see what Pope Francis is thinking about and they're actually very quite highly produced videos. So mm -hmm. it's just simply called the Pope video and uh, those are on YouTube. And that's a great way just to keep updated once a month, a 60 second video, quite well done for university students, high school students, or those who are young at heart. Thanks so much, Peter. These are all very helpful. I should sit in on your class. I'm, I'm sure uh, I'd pick up more of these things. Um, we've got uh, all sorts of questions here related to our Canadian context. Michael Swan was asking with, maybe this is referring to some of the examples in our panel um, about Latin America, you know, that our culture here is not Latin America. Uh, what works in Latin America might not work in our Canadian culture. Um, others asked about uh, the role of indigenous peoples, which, which has been highlighted. And I think Brian McDonough puts a, a good point on it. He says, in our Canadian context, it's hard to present Catholic social teaching and even Catholic inspired initiatives promoting integral eco ecological development because a lot of our energy has been taking up um, apologizing for our history or trying to decolonize or our, our past participation in colonial and assimilation policies. Um, it's hard to attract lay people, both Catholic and non-Catholic, to act in the public square in the name of the gospel. Um, and many Catholics prefer to act in non-denominational networks. This is the view expressed among many cultural Catholics in Quebec. What's your advice? And as you're thinking about that, I'll just add one more challenge to you, and that is from a rather... Um, an anonymous attendee who says, look, our people in the pews are quite tired. How do we combat fatigue and burnout? And I think, John Malloy, this goes back to your point about the other uh, things on their agenda. I'm an archdiocesan employee, and we have a lot of difficulty finding the energy amongst our people to take these things up and run with them. So uh, there's a lot there, uh, I guess, but um, we're, we're, we're busy. Uh, people are tired. Um, or uh, the church has, doesn't seem to be, uh, in the media anyway, it's often uh, portrayed in a negative light given, given um, the legacy of residential schools, et cetera. What's your advice for Catholics who are just trying to, uh, to, to move forward on this and to, 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 to claim a space that's, that's positive, to view the church as part of the solution uh, rather than part of the problem? Yeah, uh, Jenny. Well, I don't have a solution, but, um, you know, um, once a friend of mine told me, um, 
she was leaving a, an a organization that she had been working for for a long time. And I asked why, um, and she said, a Catholic organization, very good, in another country. And uh, she said, well, you know, when an organization spends more of its time uh, looking inwards rather than outwards, it's, um, it, it's not life-giving. No. And uh, I think, uh, I mean, I share a lot of the feelings and impressions that people are mentioning about, you know, getting uh, people moved and, uh, you know, we organize these wonderful events with wonderful speakers and people don't show up. <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, uh, I think uh, we have to move where the energy is. And uh, I, I want to go back a bit to... Um, you know what John was saying earlier around the need to be uh, to be to act politically, uh, John Malloy um, as as Catholics, and if that is in other fora uh, with secular groups, um, that's fine. Let you know we we act in the world like the, the, this is where in Canada where change is happening. Is it happening uh, with a group of young people working on climate change and the uh, well, let's work with them. You know, it, it doesn't matter whether it's a Catholic organization or not. You know, I think what we, um, our guide has to be, uh, you know, to, to work and, and speak up against um, anything that destroys life and encourage any activity that uh, defends life. And so, you know, if if we, we need to speak against... Uh, for example, the, the scaling back or the unequal application of the refugee regime. Because uh, uh, this, you know, when an asylum seeker is repatriated without due process, uh, without applying the Geneva Convention and is repatriated, it could mean death. And we have to fight against those kinds of policy. Or if our mining companies overseas are not respecting human rights, it does mean death for some people. And if the uh, Canadian Network for Corporate Accountability is the place where that change and that political action is happening, I'm going to work with them. And I think if we keep on uh, focusing on the fact that there is no life in some of our uh, structures, we go down with them. It's kind of a a spiraling uh, uh, feeling of, you know, to self-destruction. And I think when people see us that we are engaged in creating a more just world, I think people will join in, you know, young people or people of, of in, in other groups. And I think that's what we need to focus on. That's what keeps my um, that's what gets me get up in the morning. Otherwise, it could get pretty depressing. <laughs> Okay, uh, I see we're out of time here. And uh, uh, Jenny, I think uh, you had the last word and it was a very good one. And uh, and you've inspired all of you actually, and I'd like to thank you on behalf of all the audience here. Uh, you've inspired me to become less of a museum creator, create, curator and more of an adventure guide. And so maybe I should head back up to Northern Ontario with my friend, uh, John McCarthy and go, uh, uh, Reimmerse myself in nature because uh, we need that integral ecology. And I thank you for shedding your insights from your various backgrounds. You've really expanded our understanding of this. And um, I'd like to turn it back now to our uh, fearless leader, Michael Manulak, to uh, to wrap things up. Thanks, Father John, and thank you to all the panelists. What a terrific panel! Uh, really fascinating conversation covering many aspects. Uh, many great, great insights. Uh, it was just, uh, uh, I thought, a really great conversation. So thank you all for that. Um, so I'll, I'll wrap up with a couple of uh, concluding remarks, just mostly uh, a litany of thank yous, because one uh, uh, one has many of those in, in a, uh, we're putting together an event such as this. Uh, but first, we're, uh, we're really privileged uh, to be joined by the Apostolic Nuncio uh, to uh, Canada, uh, the Most Reverend, His Excellency, the Most Reverend Ivan Jerkovich, uh, who's, who's been with us, uh, very generous with his time to be with us uh, all day today. Um, and, um, and so I wanted to, uh, and he's, he's agreed graciously to deliver some closing remarks. Um, his Excellency um, was um, uh, uh, ordained a priest in 1977 uh, in Ljubljana, 
um, in, in Slovenia. He's, he's originally Slovenian. Uh, he's uh, studied at the Pontifical Lateran University and the Pontifical Ecclesiastical Academy. Uh, he holds a doctorate in canon law. Uh, in 1984, he entered the uh, diplomatic service of the Holy See, uh, serving in, uh, in Korea, I assume in Seoul, in Colombia, and in, in the Russian Federation, um, as well as uh, the Councilor of the Section of Relations with States uh, uh, of the Secretary of State, so serving actually in, in the Vatican and the Holy See. Uh, he's also served as the Apostolic Nuncio of Belarus, Russia, uh, Ukraine, Russia, um, and then uh, before coming to Canada uh, within the office of the United Nations and other international organizations in Geneva, probably dealing with uh, disarmament, the conference on disarmament and other issues related to that. So a very extensive diplomatic career. Uh, and now we're, uh, we're very fortunate to have him here as of June 2021 uh, here in Ottawa to, be, uh, to serve as the Apostolic Nuncio uh, to Canada. Uh, so I'm, I'm delighted to welcome um, uh, His Excellency to, uh, to our event today for some concluding remarks. Thank you so much. Um, it, is, it was um, really, uh, I, I wanted to participate in uh, all this session uh, because uh, the subject is so important and I think also initiative is so important that it, I think it's also important that we speak about this on the level of university. So for many things that are happening in the society, Universities are responsible, so we cannot avoid that, that we can be done diplomatically on the other levels. University, academia must do many things, and I think this is why I'm so happy that uh, you invited me and that you are promoting an initiative like this. What to say about me, you know, I'm, I don't want to, to I think the, the, the session was, the, the, was really extraordinarily interesting, I think it was also a crescendo. I consider the last panel as the, the highest point of today's gathering because we've said many things, uh, what is, uh, can be painful to understand, but it must be, but it's absolutely essential, you know. I'm, uh, I was of, often, often uh, hearing that people say, you know, you have to represent us. You know, diplomacy cannot represent anything if it does not exist. So it's not that uh, diplomacy uh, that uh, you need me, I need you. So this is the real thing. If you have a life of the church, and although with difficult, difficult situation, although not clear, you know, we are living in a completely different dominant culture. So, but if you have life on that side, then diplomacy can work, not vice versa, and that we are going to invent something, and then somebody is going to uh, translate that into the life. So this is why I'm, I think that the last panel, uh, I think was the really the, the highest point of today's mission. So what I'm going just why why I'm saying this because I would like to say something about my life. What's my 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 experience is completely not completely is very much different from it's a typical diplomatic experience. I know it was also ambassador Lee present here. So what I can say about let's say at least six years in Geneva. I passed the last six years in Geneva. Represent when they appointed the papal nuncio to Geneva, they give you 18 letters to different uh, organizations. Can you imagine? 18. So I took I took one year to understand what I want to assign to, what I have to was supposed to do. Uh, but um, but it is uh, it was inspiring for me. It was also giving me uh, some uh, some I have to say it was uh, motivating me to do something that uh, has become part of my life. I will tell you about two or three impressions of my presence in Geneva, which were which are related to what we said today. The first thing is you sit back in a big hall with 190 states represented and another 200 uh, international organizations and uh, NGOs. And you say, who is going to listen to me? You are part of 190 nations. We have to be humble. If you are not humble, if you pretend to be a main speaker or keynote speaker, but we are, you are not, and we are not, and we are not supposed to be, and nobody expecting from us that. What are expecting from us? Something different. What? Something similar that we said today. It means something specific, something that we consider insufficient, and is sounding, although in a, such an enormous diversity of uh, representatives is sounding nicely and properly. And what I said, 
this is uh, you you will you will you will forgive me i'm overstating things that are obviously overstated i think that the voice of voice let's say the catholic church is the only structured religious organizations that's participating in international institutions it is extremely important for us for two reasons first and most important reason that we learn the language of the others that we understand what the other are saying and that we use the same language, that we do not invent a language that's not going to be understandable to anybody. So it means this is our school. It is not our way, our, our class where we teach, but this school, uh, this international organization is a, is a place where we learn. And I was always trying to learn. And I think what we learn, what we learned is nice. We have to, we are capable to speak in the language that is absolutely presentable, understood, and probably also inspiring for the others. If you see the world, is, there are other big uh, Greek religious organizations who could do the same thing, but they are not capable because probably the language wouldn't be understood or the approach of the society and the capacity of dialogue with the today's society is insufficient. So you have enormous segment of the world of mankind and you see that uh, this mankind is practically not, not able to speak, they are able to speak, but they don't know how to say. And they are happy that you say certain things because they share with you certain values and certain aspects. And this is what we have to say. We are speaking not only in name of the uh, Catholic Church, Catholic institutions, uh, we are speaking in the name of anybody else that is probably not ready for time being, or at least to speak and to communicate the same values to the society. The other thing that we, you learn when you sit in a big community of nations, and this is dramatically important, I think should be, it is certainly present also in today's conversation, is that I was talking to the Director General of the International Confederation Red Cross and Red Crescent. This is the biggest uh, organization of um, humanitarian organization in the world in terms of many things. And he said, you know, Excellency, what we do is nothing. It's a, just a drop in the, in the sea of needs. And, and, uh, and this is what you, you, you when you talk to United Nations, when you, not United Nations, the world, you have to consider that more or less 90, 90 to 95, they said that time, I don't know, nations of the world are living in a stress or post-stress situation. So I think what we, we have to speak about that half of the world that is living in the stress. They even don't, don't know how to present their situation. It's a very essential that we never go too far away from the situation of the world as a such, you know, where we are all, all <laughs> as I presented, all this. it is so important that, um, you know, let's say just one thing, you know, I had, a visit of a bishop from Central African Republic. And I wanted to explain to him, you know, we had a session of international labor organization and the main subject was uh, informal employment. I started to talk to him, then I stopped. I said, you know, what I'm saying, this does not apply completely a situation of his, uh, his. he was, <laughs> he said the only employment in his city was taxi driver. There were not even that formal, more or less formal employment. Even, but even that was not formal. There's no formal employment. I learned 75% of the world employment is informal. And this part is still growing. So I think when you are talking to the place like Canada and many other places, countries, certainly, you know, <laughs> thanks to well-organized country, very structured country with many qualities, enormous qualities, a world is running, we cannot say that's nothing, but we cannot forget that, that we are more exception than a rule. You know? We are more exception than a rule. And certainly, uh, if you go to, 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 to migration, you know, we are complaining about migration in Europe for 2 million people, but we do not complain about 50 million people in migration in Africa. And, uh, you know, so it means that this is a uh, uh, real world, is, uh, the, we should always keep in mind. Uh, what Pope, Pope Francis is uh, helping us to do that. 
I don't know what, I have still one minute, okay. Uh, so uh, I, I'm just, um, I would say some other things that are um, uh, certainly uh, uh, relevant, certainly in uh, disarmament so on, but I'm not going to that because we have no time. Uh, just one more thing. You were talking about Catholicism, which is a word that Catholicism, so for the school is good, but on the street is already and uh, difficult to pronounce already. But I would say even when the word, one more uh, more difficult word we use uh, 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 that um, would be papacy. You know, papacy. We are we have a pope, and you are, allow me to speak about the pope because I'm represented with the pope for 40 years. So this is I wouldn't say anything would be wrong. You know, although uh, probably you know that what I'm going to say. We have a papacy. And this papacy must have, every papacy must have a physio physiognomy, you know? And that is a very difficult task, you know? You have a big Pope, let's say we have Pope John Paul II, you know, and a monumental physiognomy. We have Pope Benedict XVI, very relevant in uh, physiognomy. And we, we have Pope Francis coming. And, uh, you know, the first thing is when, what is the end of Physiognomy of the additional papers, you know. And we have a nice physiognomy. And this physiognomy of the papacy, I think, will be forever linked to two subjects and many others probably still. But two certainly. First is Laudato Si your environment. You know, for the international organizations, I remember arriving in Geneva in 2016. Ambassador were trying to, you know, giving me compliments. They said, you know, you know, in Paris, in the session on the uh, on the uh, on the climate uh, uh, treaty, you know, so there was almost every head of state was referring to the Pope as inspiration. I think <laughs> that is going to stay. You know, we are going to uh, we can uh, we will not be ashamed in the future when history is going to judge us as as judge us always that we were. Because of the papacy, with this video of papacy, because of many other things, academy, I would say also, we were we were attentive on the sensibility of the modern world, which is environment. I think uh, something very, very, very strong and not less important, uh, um, uh, attention to the migra migration, especially in developed world, but also in many other places, with uh, with the, also with the document Fratelli Tutti. And many other initiatives that are linked to the uh, by, 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 to the to this papers is certainly uh, certainly his action for the peace, you know, capacity to be promote peace where possible, to, uh, capacity to promote anti-military ideas. You know, the Holy See was the first uh, nation that was signing a treaty of prohibition of atomic uh, weapons and so on. So it means we have a papacy. We have something that. We can work within. I think what was said today in the last panel is exactly what we have to we have to add that this uh, physiognomy of the papacy will become physiognomy of the church, physiognomy of our uh, our what we do, what we are, or physiognomy of our time as as a Catholic certainly, and uh, as probably also physiognomy also I think of a certain initiatives of the of the universities and other places. So this is what I wanted to say, thanking you again for this very kind invitation. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, um, for a really uh, interesting set of comments. Um, and it just uh, uh, comes to me to, uh, to conclude this, uh, this conference. Thank you very much for, uh, for all of your participation. I'd like to uh, thank uh, particularly Mark uh, McGowan for, uh, for his involvement and the involvement of St. Michael's College and Natalie, who's uh, been involved heavily uh, answering all kinds of emails from all kinds of absent-minded professors and so on uh, about uh, all kinds of things. Uh, and so she's uh, really uh, pulled much of this, uh, this together. So we're enormously grateful to uh, to, to St. Michael's College for uh, really helping to make this happen. Um, the whole event was envisioned uh, as an initial conversation. I am by no means an expert on in, uh, very few of these issues. And, um, and uh, a group of us uh, kind of came together, uh, Father John Meehan, John Malloy, and Leahy and I at the beginning uh, talking about this and, and really formulating this. So um, I'm, I'm so very grateful to, uh, to the three of them. 
uh, for, uh, for coming on and, and providing advice all along the way and structuring this. Uh, and then uh, to, to Peter Baltudis, who had some really terrific suggestions for panelists. Uh, quite a few of them are, are here with us right now. Um, and uh, so enormously grateful to, to Peter and then to all of our panelists who really became part of the organizing group as we exchanged dozens of emails over the coming, uh, the, the past weeks, uh, Joe and Jenny and Severin and Massimo, uh, who, who really contributed a lot to, to forming this, uh, this event. So um, also thankful, of course, to our keynote speaker and again to uh, His Excellency for joining us for some concluding remarks. Uh, and finally, to, uh, to all of you uh, who um, sat and, and participated in, in with so many active questions, so many challenging questions, uh, I thought that uh, that uh, that really stimulated the conversation. Uh, thank you all very much for uh, for joining us this day. Um, I really hope that we'll all be able to uh, to take something away from this uh, this conversation intellectually, spiritually, uh, and uh, and in all aspects. Um, and and be that part. I thought Jenny had this this great phrase: the capillary presence of of the church in, in terms of implementing and, and, and ultimately getting our hands dirty and uh, advancing and contributing to global sustainable development. So I hope um, that, uh, that we'll all be able to, uh, to take that away and to bring something forward from this conference. Um, so I hope all of you have a really great afternoon. Thanks again for, uh, for coming. Uh, it's been, it's been uh, really interesting and a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thanks everybody.